Hey everybody, it's JJ and we're back again for another ASUS PC DIY live stream. This time around, we're really excited because it's actually going to be uh, for the latest generation of Z7 series, excuse me, Z790 series based motherboards. So of course, uh, the day has come. Of course, Intel has gone ahead and made their announcement for the latest generation of 14th gen series CPUs. And of course, ASUS being the world's largest motherboard manufacturer, we are ready. And uh, we already started a little bit of the announcements a little while ago, of course, with three different models uh, that we introduced under our Tough Gaming series, as well as our RG Strix series, as well as our Maximus series, our RG Maximus flagship series. Uh, for this stream, though, we're actually going to be bringing you guys all the boards. So that's right, we've actually got a further amount of boards uh, specifically for the RG Strix series, as well as for the uh, RG Maximus series. So we're going to get ready to go ahead and jump in that in here, guys. And uh, give me one second here. Let's see who we have joining us here today on the stream. Uh, we've got everybody from Michael joining us here on the stream. We've got uh, Khalid joining us here from the stream. We've got another Michael joining us here from the stream, uh, Kira Gaming. Uh, Econor40 joining us here and of course the one the only snuff computer design one of the best builders and modders in the game so thank you for all of you guys that are joining us in today's stream hopefully you guys are going to find it pretty interesting pretty exciting we've got a lot of things to cover so let's go ahead and dive into it quickly just the boards that we're going to go ahead and dive into for this live stream I've got an entire stack right here next to me we're going to get into it so um Give me one second, let me here, go ahead and share this with you guys, and we'll show you which boards we're going to be diving into. So uh, first and foremost, the first board that we're going to go ahead and touch on is going to be in our Tough Gaming series. So this is going to be a refresh to our Tough Gaming Z790 Plus with the Tough Gaming Z790 Pro Wi-Fi. So that will be one of the boards that we're going to be covering. Uh, we're also going to go ahead and touch on another board. Uh, so that's going to be for the ROG Strix series. So let's go ahead and take a look at the ROG Strix series of boards, which ones we're going to go ahead and jump into there. Uh, and for ROG Strix, we're going to have a total of three different series of boards that we're going to go ahead and touch on. So here we're going to have essentially the ROG Strix Z790-A gaming Wi-Fi 2. So that's going to be an update for the ever kind of perennial favorite for those of you that are looking for a white silver theme based motherboard. Really great foundation to be able to be an entryway into our enthusiast ROG Strix series motherboards. We've also got two really great options that I think for a lot of you are going to be really great choices uh, because they really hit a sweet spot in terms of just the features, function, specifications that they bring to the table I think are going to be really great value options. So we're going to have the ROG Strix Z790-F gaming Wi-Fi 2 and then of course we're going to be talking about the ROG Strix Z790-E gaming Wi-Fi 2 which for I think a lot of the people before they get into the Maximus series is a very popular board because it really brings a huge amount of specs to the table. Uh, very exciting and especially if somebody is interested in terms of not only things like Wi-Fi 7 but 5M.2 and even PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD support. The Dash E is going to be the the model for you. But I know many of you, of course, watching us the stream here are, of course, excited about the flagship series of products, uh, which are going to, of course, be our highest and ROG Maximus series. So we are going to be talking, of course, about those guys as well. So you can see right here, we've got three new ROG Maximus series boards with the ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero. That's going to be an update, of course, to the Perennial Hero series. Then we've got an update with the Apex, the Apex Encore. So not only are we refreshing it into a uh, previous color uh, from white to black but we've got some really cool additions for this apex encore so for those that are really going to look to push those clocks um but also looking actually for some very impressive uh core specification support the apex on port may be the board for you and then of course rounding it out we're bringing back the formula where of course for the original launch of the z790 chipset we did not actually offer a formula board so we're updating of course the uh, original z7 excuse me z690 version with now a z790 version but there's going to be quite a number of improvements so we're going to tackle each one of the boards, and so you guys have a clear understanding, the way I'm going to go ahead and break it down is we'll have essentially, hopefully, a clear slide that will break down to you essentially what are the differences between the prior board, and then what are you going to get with the new board. So then hopefully if you want to be able to compare and contrast. But of course, many of you that are uh, maybe looking to buy these boards, you might not actually be right now on a Socket 1700 series-based motherboard. So you might not be running Z690, you might not be running Z790, maybe you're still on an older Intel platform, maybe you're on an older AMD platform, maybe you've been waiting to kind of make your upgrade and so the great thing is here we're going to also recap essentially what you're going to be getting if you decide to build or upgrade to this chipset to this platform what are you going to be getting in terms of the core specification support and how that's going to break down so we're going to go ahead and be talking about all those different items um, now i am watching the stream guys i will essentially intermittently be able to jump into the chat and be able to see what we might have in terms of questions so um, just kind of be apprised that what i'll generally do in terms of questions for the stream is i'll tend to tackle them after each 
each board. But I'll try to watch it as we're kind of going a little bit over the fly over the board and the what's new highlight for each one of those boards. I'll attempt to take a look at the comments and see if we have uh, any specific points that I can go ahead and elaborate on. Now, if I happen to miss your question, feel free to go ahead and follow up with us in our ASUS PC DIY group. It's linked in the description below if you guys are checking us out on YouTube. Uh, it's a great community where, of course, we will be able to go ahead and follow up with all the specifics uh, that you might be wondering about when it comes to our features, functions, designs, or anything else like that. So with that, let's quickly go ahead and first just touch on the base elements of, I think, this chipset and this platform, and uh, we'll go ahead and get into it. So let's go ahead and go just with a quick recap of recap of Z790 chipset, what do you get? So let's go ahead and quickly take a look at the chipset block. So I think this will probably be most pertinent for those of you that probably haven't made essentially the upgrade, right? So you're still essentially running maybe a prior generation platform. So you might be wondering, well, what am I going to be getting? Well, if we take a look here at the overall 700 series chipset diagram, we can actually see really all the core specifications that we're going to be getting if we decide to upgrade to this platform. So uh, of course, your CPU has PCI Express lanes, it has the memory controller. So it's going to be defining a lot. So uh, with Intel series CPUs, they do actually support both DDR4 and DDR5, but all of the refresh motherboards that we're going to be talking about are exclusively DDR5. So keep that in mind. If you want DDR4, we still do have DDR4 offerings um, in our Z690 and our Z790 first wave series of motherboards. But all of the refresh boards that we're going to be talking about are focused on DDR5. Now, uh, we'll talk a little bit more in terms about performance in a forthcoming live stream later this week as we still have a performance embargo in place. But uh, you can go ahead and... Um, create a baseline in terms of understanding that DDR5, of course, has an overclocked level of frequency that oftentimes gets communicated. And then you have your base, what's called Intel port table, which is the default operating specifications. So that's actually what this number is right here. That's not reflective as, let's say, the overclocking range that the CPU may allow or the overclocking range that the motherboards may allow for. If we use actually 13 gen as an example, uh, it's very common that 13 gen, um, about 75% of the CPUs approximately could hit about 7,000 MT. So that's quite a bit of a healthy overclock. And you'll definitely be able to have a great DDR5 overclocking experience. And we're gonna talk about some cool features that these motherboards bring to the table, especially if you're interested in DDR5 overclocking. Um, for PCI Express support, it's pretty straightforward. You can see that the CPU is gonna provide you 16 lanes up to PCI Express Gen 5. Of course, all graphics cards on the market right now are only PCI Express Gen 4. Uh, you do have four dedicated lanes for a primary PCIe NVMe M.2 SSD. Um, so if you're running a Gen 4 M.2 SSD, you can essentially run by 16 and by four, there's no uh, limitations. If you decide though that you want to run a PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD, you will be pulling lanes away from the CPU. Now, in reality though, that's not a factor. Um, you know, if we, if we take a look at something even like this, this is, uh, you know, this is our Tough Gaming RTX 4090. It's about the fastest graphics card you can get on the market. Uh, if you talk about an overall GPU, uh, 4090 even running at by eight speeds will not be limited in terms of its overall performance. So you don't have to be worried that if, you know, based on kind of the layout of the board of the configuration, if it drops into a by eight to be able to then provide other essentially links uh, from those PCI Express lanes, are you going to essentially see a reduction in performance you won't? So it's not something you have to worry about. Beyond that, some of the other core things that, of course, you will get is uh, you get high speed networking. Every single one of the boards will be offering at least 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. All the boards will be offering a minimum of at least Wi-Fi 6E, with actually the majority being all Wi-Fi 7. Uh, you'll all all the boards will have high speed USB 3.2, including a minimum of at least to see uh, 20 gigabits USB. So you're going to be able to have four times faster than traditional USB speed of uh, five gigabit space connections. Uh, and then you're also, of course, going to still maintain traditional support for things like SATA connectivity on the boards. So overall, that gives us a base quick recap of what we're talking about from the chipset side. So now that we've got that out of the way, we're going to quickly take a look at the just the CPUs that are available and released. Uh, we're going to quickly make a note on interoperability and compatibility when it comes to the motherboards. And then we're going to start getting into the actual boards themselves. I'm going to go ahead and quickly just check and see if we have any quick questions that might have just came up somewhere on the uh, on the chipset side of the conversation. Hey, JC, uh, he's looking uh, to be excited about uh, the Apex Encore. Sounds pretty great. Um, a core 40 is actually about a Maximus Extreme. No, I can confirm for you at this time that the only Maximus boards that we will be actually launching for the refresh uh, at this time are going to be the Dark Hero, the Formula, and the Apex Encore. So those are going to be the three new Maximus series based motherboards, and we will be diving into those. So we're going to be good to go. Michael Bronze talking about some high speed DDR5 memory. So we're going to be getting into that in a little bit with some cool features. Um, and uh, Billy's actually asking when are these are actually going to be available for purchase. So um, 
I'll be touching on that and I will actually have MSRP pricing for all of the boards in question. Uh, the Tough Gaming motherboard that we're actually gonna be talking about first, so this guy right here, I'm gonna be getting into this one in a little bit. This one's actually already available online. Uh, the ROG Dark Hero is also available online and the, IP, the ROG Strix-A is also available online. The newer boards that we're talking about today that are just being announced today, so these new Strix models and the remaining Maxima series, those will be coming online uh, in about the next week or so, about, probably about the next seven to 12 days, depending on the e-tailer. So you'll see them pop up at you know Amazon, Newegg, Micro Center, BNH, any one of our channel partners will have the boards. So we'll touch on the pricing so you're aware of that. Um, but yeah, just watch out for them. They're going to be coming up very, very quickly in the next coming days. Okay. All right. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, jump into our next quick recap right here, which is just going to quickly touch on, I think, the CPU based information. So just in case you're kind of wondering about what we're looking at for the new 14th gen series of CPUs, we can quickly touch on that. So again, we can't touch any performance-based information. That'll be coming a little bit later, and you guys can, of course, check out a wide range of the views that'll be, of course, out from media in that regard. But we will actually have a full dedicated live stream where we'll be actually doing performance tuning. We're gonna be doing overclocking on the CPU. We're gonna show off our DimFlex technology. We're gonna do some DDR5 overclocking, some AAOC demonstrations uh, with 14th gen. So we have a whole dedicated stream coming up, uh, I believe later this week, uh, that we'll dive into that if you're interested on all the performance kind of pieces, okay? Um, but just giving you kind of a recap here in terms of what we're seeing from the CPUs, uh, you have your traditional kind of stack that's going to be available. All of the motherboards that we're talking about fully support all the i9s, the i7, and the i5 series of CPUs. So you don't have to be worried about any one of the boards. And even before I get into it, uh, just right out, even if you were to buy the Tough Gaming board and you were to pair it with the latest uh, 4900K series of CPU, you're going to have a stable and reliable and very performant experience, whether you're running stock or overclocked. So you shouldn't kind of isolate the board purchase based on a proposition of thinking that I have to go to a higher end board to be able to get a stable and reliable experience. You'll be able to get a great experience uh, with any one of the boards that we're talking about, including, like I said, the most entry uh, Tough Gaming board that we're going to be noting on. So no worries in that respect. Now, now, what we can see right here is that for the most part, things are going to look pretty similar. We are seeing essentially some clock bumps up where you can actually see some pretty aggressive clock frequencies. This will be the first CPU from Intel where they're noting, of course, that six gigahertz max turbo frequency. Of course, keep in mind that's on a singular thread, right? So that's max opportunistic turbo. And if we compare this to 13 uh, gen, you can actually see that overall, you're usually talking somewhere about two to 300 megahertz uh, bumps in terms of the frequency. The i7 might be maybe for a lot of you, maybe one of the most exciting SKUs because of course it has seen quite a bit of a pump up in terms of the actual number of total threads that are available. So you can actually see right here, the Core i9 is gonna be 32 threads, the Core i7 will be 28 threads, and the Core i5 will be 20 threads all very, very performant parts, really amazing experience regardless of what you're gonna be doing. Also make note, some people forget about outside of threads that there is a cache differential, so you can see that there is a cache difference between the Core i9, the Core i7, and the Core i5. Memory support is gonna be the same across the board. PCI Express lanes is going to be the same across the board. One thing I will generally note though, is that generally because the uh, i9 series is going to be the best bin series CPUs because they offer the fastest level of performance, we also generally see the best DDR5 overclocking margin from them. But we'll be talking more about that in our performance live stream. So as always, make sure to keep it tuned there. So uh, I think that goes ahead and gets us covered in terms of the core stuff from the chipset side and the CPU side. And again, if you're worrying about if you have like a Z690 motherboard or maybe you still want to buy a 690 board that we offer and it's on a great deal, maybe a Z790 series motherboard or B760 series motherboards, B660, all of our Socket 1700 series motherboards have all received UEFI BIOS updates to allow for interoperability, compatibility, and support for 14th gen series CPUs. So outside of these boards that we're talking about, all of our Socket 1700 series boards have essentially these UEFI updates. You just have to update the UEFI BIOS and the MEI firmware. That's important. Make sure to update both of those items and you can support those next generation 14th gen series CPUs. All right, guys. So that's going to take care of that. I think now we're going to go ahead and get ready to jump into the new boards. Um, and so let's go ahead and start off actually with the Tough Gaming SKU. Let me go ahead and quickly see if there's any quick question that might have come up there. Um, 
I'm wishing, okay, so yeah, so right here, I can actually already see this a question. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit when we uh, talk about the boards and how the, uh, m m all the motherboards at a minimum. One of the really cool things is we're gonna have a minimum at least four M.2 slots, uh, which will be starting off on the Tough Gaming. And then pretty much every other motherboard in the stack is gonna have five M.2 slots on it. So M.2, uh, we've seen a lot of demand from the community in terms of wanting to see this improved specification support. So that's definitely gonna be apparent. But a lot of people overstress about that PCI lean allocation thing where they just go i want my gpu to run it by 16 the reality is it doesn't matter you do not need it to run it by 16 like again even if you had a 4090 uh, and that card was running it by 8 you're not going to see a performance difference between it running it by 16 and running it by 8 and we've even done a latest generation testing with that with uh, actually our flagship series rog swift 540 hertz monitor uh, which is the fastest gaming monitor on the market and it's really much going to be the most demanding in terms of attempting to saturate the pipeline. Um, so overall, again, it's not a factor, um, but there are going to be things that you're going to want to keep in mind in terms of how different slots will utilize different PCI Express lanes and how that might affect other portions of the board. So we'll jump into a little bit more of that as we get into each board, but uh, let's go ahead and get into it first. Uh, so let's take a look at our first board here. We're going to go with the Tough Gaming board first. So let me bring up our primary image of this guy right here. And... <clears throat> So this is going to be the Tough Gaming series. We're only going to have one model in the Tough Gaming series refresh, which is going to be the Tough Gaming Z790 Pro Wi-Fi. It's going to be coming in at $299, okay? Uh, so that's going to be about a $50 increase compared to the current Z790 Plus Wi-Fi, okay? So let's go ahead and we'll take a closer look at it, but let's quickly just recap actually what are you going to get? What is the kind of the big improvement that you're going to have for this generation um, compared to, let's say, the prior generation? So we'll go ahead and take a look at that. So go ahead and bring up my slide right here for this one and what's new all right here we go all right so first up uh, for the Tough Gaming motherboard, we can actually see right here, here's the Tough Gaming Z790 Plus, and here's this Tough Gaming Z790 Pro. So here's your current generation. Uh, we actually had this in a DDR4, and we also had it in DDR5, but we're comparing the DDR5 to the DDR5. So the first thing you're going to see is, of course, a little bit of an aesthetic difference. It's going to be pretty similar, though. They're both monochrome series-based motherboards, so they are not really don't have any bold kind of colors to contend or compete with your build. They are pretty much a very black-themed board, so if you don't want to even run any RGB, it's great. This board actually doesn't have almost any RGB on it anyways. There's pretty much only one RGB lighting zone right here. Uh, compared, actually, to the prior one, we actually had two RGB lighting zones, one right here and one right here. So for the most part, there's pretty much no uh, kind of apparent kind of RGB lighting. So for those of you like Team Stealth, Team Dark type setups, then this board is going to be a great foundation. Overall, you're going to nominally see uh, even better DDR5 overclocking support. The internal USB-C header, both of these boards had this, but the Tough Gaming Plus board had actually 20 gigabits on the rear, but it wasn't 20 gigabits internally. Uh, for this board, you actually also now see 20 gigabits USB-C internally. Now keep in mind, your chassis may need to actually have specification support for that, but that's quite a bit faster. Um, default, you're usually seeing either 5 gigabits or 10 gigabits for the internal internal USB, so offering 20 gigabits is a noticeable bump up in terms of the performance. Now this next one is a really big one and one I'm really excited about. Uh, we've never offered our ASUS AOC overclocking technology on our Tough Gaming series of motherboards. It's a really amazing feature. If we actually get a little bit closer right here, that little guy right there is one of the key reasons why uh, we can now offer this feature and that's because it's a hardware level feature. It's not just a firmware level feature within the UEFI, it's an actually amalgamation of everything from our power topology to actually the microcontroller that we put on the board to the firmware. Um, and and we'll go a little bit more into kind of ASUS AOC, but the really cool thing about it is that it is CPU and cooler specific. So essentially, if you put in there, you know, a 13900K, a 14900K, a 14700K, 13700K, and then you had a 240 millimeter AO, a 360 millimeter AO, or maybe you had a, uh, <laughs> I dropped, I think my fan there, a tower heat sink, right? Um, that is going to be weighted by the actual algorithm continually. It will monitor the actual cooling performance, it'll monitor the actual CPU's quality, and it will give you an overclock that is specific to your CPU. So it's not just a preset. It's a quite uh, advanced, mature, and very flexible feature where you actually have the ability to further fine tune it in a lot of different ways. And we'll talk a lot about that a little bit later. Uh, this board now also sees the introduction of our AI cooling technology. This is essentially kind of like a more advanced version of our current set of fan controls, which are available in the operating system as well as in the BIOS but it takes it further by essentially automating the process. It will automatically essentially uh, make adjustments to the fans 
uh, bringing their fan speed down while actually monitoring the overall temperature. Um, generally, it will be about a five degree swing where essentially if it notices, hey, the temperature is pretty stable, I can bring down the fans a little bit more, the temps will go up a little bit more, but you'll even get a quieter experience, you'll get less power draw. Um, Think about it kind of like if you were just sitting watching a stream, maybe checking out some email, looking at some photos, right? Um, watching a YouTube video, things along those lines, you could even go to a more kind of moderate system. And if you don't want to kind of worry about using fan curves or anything like that, you could just engage a AI cooling and it will work directly um, by essentially taking that kind of uh, that optimal approach at say, Hey, hey, there's a little bit of margin here because the system's not working and it'll even bring it down a little bit lower. Um, and of course, the moment a load comes back up, it will ramp back up. Uh, AMP2 is a cool technology. Of course, we had a prior version of this where we can take actually memory that does not have an XMP profile and we'll be actually able to allow for you to have a really streamlined overclock experience. And I'll show you an example of this. An example is you could buy like a kit of 5,600 memory and we can take that module and maybe overclock it to like 66, 6,800, 7,000 MT and you don't have to know anything. You don't have to know about adjusting the voltages. You don't have to know about memory timing adjustments, any of these things. You essentially just go in there and you can select that. That I think is a really exciting feature for maybe the Tough Gaming series. So if you wanna save even more money, not necessarily buy higher spec XMP memory um, and you're fine maybe just running stock, but maybe you want to get some extra performance, AMP2 is a pretty cool option. We've also updated for this generation to actually allow for interoperability and compatibility, not with just two DIMMs, but actually also with four DIMMs, even though there's not many four DIMM kits on the market. Q antenna is a really cool new design that we have, which is a more seamless and easy way to be able to install the Wi-Fi antenna on the motherboard. QLED and DIMM detect. I will show you actually a demo of this. This is pretty cool. The actual LED diagnostic system that we have on the motherboard. Uh, there's four LEDs, one for the CPU, one for the DRAM, one for the graphics card, and one for the boot device. Uh, for this generation, we actually now have even a little bit more intelligence that if it doesn't necessarily detect the memory's actually been installed correctly, um, it will actually illuminate with you, uh, illuminate an LED on the board, letting you know, hey, you might need to actually reseat or fully seat the memory module. So it's not a full kind of comprehensive uh, DRAM diagnostic, but it helps to kind of even take the QLED system even further to be able to give you some additional value. And the last item right here you're gonna see is actually a little bit of a change uh, of the slot layout configuration where you can actually see here the slot layout here you had a physical by 16 here you had a physical by 16 but electrically of course it wasn't an, uh, an electrical by 16 um, and you can see that the slot arrangement has differed up uh, we went with this different configuration which was a little bit more complementary to I think complement users that are looking for more flexibility in these lower slots for maybe expansion devices now one thing I want to note uh, specifically on this board right when we take a look at it here um, is that when you're actually talking about a motherboard uh, you might see other competitors in the market that they will actually stack a lot of their M.2 all directly underneath this part of the motherboard. Uh, we tend to try to not to do that. And the part of the reason why, as you'll notice here at the top, we actually have, of course, our M.2 SSD slot, right? And that's fully isolated. So even when we have the graphics card in there, that, that uh, slot is accessible. Uh, the other reason is you notice all the way down here where we have actually other M.2 SSDs. So there's one here, there's a second here, and then there's a third one right here. That actually is a little bit more advantageous than some competitors that might have like three slots all right underneath here because then all the slots are going to be obstructed by the graphics card. And then also, even if you have a heat sink, you're actually going to generally have an increase in the thermals for those drives because you're actually creating a little bit of a choke point, right? There's a little bit more restriction. There's a little bit more ambient heat that's pooling. So I can show this to you as an example. Um, let me just go ahead and put a graphics card. We'll take a look here at a display here uh, and we're going to go into some of the other elements here, but let me uh, go here to my secondary display and we can kind of take a look and I can show you here kind of what I'm talking about a little bit more closely. So let's take a look right here. So uh, here we can take a closer look at the board. You'll actually notice one of the cool things right here is we actually have this cool little actually raised textured material. It's a little bit of a soft rubber material. It's nice. It gives it just a little bit of a textural element that looks a little bit different. Uh, I really like the look of the Tough Gaming series. I think they look really nice, really clean. Um, ha definitely have that kind of quote unquote tough gaming feel, right? Um, you'll see right there, like I said, that small RGB lighting zone. You've got three ARGB headers, which is par for the course. Lots of fan headers that are going to be on this board. Tons of options when it comes to that. But if we scroll down uh, to the board, uh, well, not scroll down, but we move right here. Here we can see, of course, the PCI slot layout, right? So here you can see you've got your primary M.2 SSD. Here's the graphics card. So I'm going to go ahead and take a graphics card. 
Uh, this is actually our dual series graphics card. I think this would actually be a pretty nice choice right here. This is our 4070. So um, this is actually only a 2.5 slot card, so it works pretty nicely in terms of you can still see that even down here, I would still have access to these to this slot and to this slot and to this slot so actually all three additional slots are still available to me when i have this dual card right um, but one of the cool features that we first want to show and probably most of you already know it but all of the motherboards that we're going to show have this feature which is the q release design which if you see i can press down this button and then i can just remove the graphics card really easily so it's a really nice option but let's say you went to a higher performing graphics card so let's say you want to kind of go for your min max proposition you want to go for really high end build and we go with something like a, uh, a 4090 now 4090 you can see right here is actually going to cover all of those slots now even in this design though you can still see this one down here right that actual that that heat sink is still accessible with some other competitors that slot would not be accessible so here i still have this available i wouldn't necessarily have to remove the graphics card to be able to have access to it although it's very easy with that pci express um, but thermally also this is a little bit better right because at least here this is a little bit more isolated which is some other competitors essentially you know two or three of these slots are going to be all directly underneath this graphics card so that's something that you may not realize and you may not even see uh, maybe some media cover in quote unquote reviews um, but it is something that I would say that you kind of want to be mindful of uh, just to notice from a kind of design differential. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and give me one second here. And uh, we'll go ahead and make an adjustment here. Okay, um, all right guys, so here, the next thing I wanna show you, probably most of you are pretty familiar with this, but I do wanna show you for those that might be kind of upgrading for the first time, maybe to a newer board, and you have a much older motherboard. Of course, this board does have one, two, three, four M.2 SSD slots. Now, one of the differences on the Tough Gaming compared to some of the higher end models will be that none of these um, M.2 slots will be PCI Express Gen 5. They will support PCI Express Gen 4, which is great because that still gives you support for even direct storage. But if you do want PCI Express Gen 5 support, you will need to jump up to at least the ROG Strix Dash E. Okay. Now you can see right here, we've of course got our M.2 slot right there. And if I want to install it, the nice thing is, of course, if you guys haven't taken a look at this, this is something that we, of course, uh, released a while back on our Z Z690 series. But now um, it's, of course, on pretty much all of our new boards. But we have our Q-latch design, which is really nice. So just like we had a really easy ejection mechanism right there, you can see right there I've locked in the M.2 SSD. It's a really easy process to be able to install it. And it's on this one, it's on this one, it's on this one, it's on this one. So you have essentially four quick M.2 installation points right on the board and uh, your heat sinks. Now, I will show you a little bit later on also that there will be a difference in the heat sink design. While you have three heat sinks that are on this board, uh, the higher end boards, you will start to see what's called a dual contact uh, heat sink design, which means that there's actually a heat sink and thermal pads on the underside. And that can be advantageous for um, uh, larger capacity or even higher performing M.2 SSDs, although this is a pretty high performing one. This is a very fast 7,000 uh, megabyte uh, PCI Express Gen 4 drive. Okay, so that gives you a quick recap right there. Uh, let me go ahead and just see right here if we got any quick questions that might have came up on just some of those items for this Tough Gaming board. So give me one second here. All right. Um, that is very nice of the Z7. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, how many three pins? So Robert is asking us how many uh, three pin ARGB headers does it have? So this one is gonna be pretty much just like what we've done with all motherboards. Actually, every single board that we're gonna talk about has the same. So right here, you can see you've got one. Uh, this is your legacy. Of course, this is gonna be your four pin. That's your three pin. And that is gonna, and then we scroll all the way down right here. You're gonna have another. So you have a total of three ARGB headers. So that's going to be actually on every single board. They're all going to have three ARGB headers. But, um, you know, it's important to kind of note that if you do feel that you need more ARGB headers, keep in mind that you can pretty much put one of these, like this is a splitter. Uh, you can put this on any header. And generally, in most situations, you can usually split out um, 
conservatively be three, but I'd say in most situations, really for most devices like our fans, um, you know, coolers, LED strips, you can usually do between four to six additional devices connected to one single header. So you can easily connect, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12 devices on a system with three headers. You would just essentially be using something like this, like a splitter, or you could go out to a controller or something along those lines. The only thing you have to keep in mind that is uh, when you use something like a splitter like this is that of course it will mirror the RGB signal across all the devices connected to that one header, okay? All right, so that is going to be uh, pretty much uh, I think most of the items on the Tough Gaming board. Now, but here I do actually want to show you one of the Q kind of cool new features that we have, which is going to be the Q, um, the Q dim detect feature. So let me go ahead and take some dims here, and I will go ahead and show you that, guys. Um, so give me one second here. So uh, get some feedback right there that the. Um, the PCIe quick release was a really good idea. Yeah, for sure. It's a much nicer uh, kind of way to just easier way to be able to go ahead and access the M.2 SSDs. So I'm going to go ahead and connect my power supply here in a moment. But what we actually want to show you right here is that there will be LEDs. There are going to be four LEDs and I'll show this on the close up cam. And what we're actually able to do now is we have a little bit of kind of sensing logic in here that kind of understands what might be happening when you're working with your memory. So let me go ahead and connect my power supply here so give me one second and the cool thing is again some of these these features that i'm kind of showing you they will be unilaterally on all the boards so if pretty much you see it on a tough gaming board it's going to be on an rg strix board it will be on the maxima series board there might even be a more kind of advanced version of it okay so let me go ahead and now actually i haven't checked it here without the CPU installed so it'll be interesting to see how it goes in that respect so we'll if we need to we'll pop on the CPU really quickly just so you guys can see it in that way but give me one second all right and actually you can already see one of the lights so Go ahead and toggle this over right here. So right here, you can actually see there. You see, guys, right there, how there's an LED. Okay. So normally, you always want to follow your A2 and your B2 banks for memory installation. That's always uh, detailed within your manual. So you would always want to look in your manual and find out what are your primary operating banks. But you'll notice right there what happened. You'll see that the actual... Uh, LED actually turned off, right? So pretty cool, right? Um, so let me go ahead and do that right there. So you actually see if I opened up the latch on the memory, the actual LED came back on. So you'll see right there, the LED is still on. So we're gonna go ahead and now push that back and you'll see that the LED turns off. So we have a little bit kind of more logic here. So in the past, you might have gotten a DRAM LED light to essentially let you know that maybe there was like a memory training issue. There could have been maybe something that could have been correlated to maybe like a DRAM overclock. Um, if you had maybe too aggressive of a, um, maybe a DRAM divider and XMP profile and your CPU didn't support that. But at least for some builders, now this even gives you a little bit more reference that, hey, when I'm putting together the system, if I essentially see that little light on, I might need to actually double check and verify that my actual memory is installed. So again, you can see right there how the LED is on and I'm going to go ahead and now depress it and you can see actually how the LED turns off. So that's what we're talking about when we note the uh, Q LED, but the dim detect feature, essentially that just allows you to have a little bit of an easier way to be able to verify that your memory is actually installed and it's generally working correctly. Now, of course, that means you still need to perform memory testing and things along those lines, right? But it just helps you to get a little bit of a, um, and an improvement when it comes to the DIY experience. So this is all part of kind of certain functions or features that we put on the boards to try to make things a little bit easier for you from a builder perspective, okay? So um, that is gonna be the quick demo there for that. And again, uh, somebody was asking about the extreme. There was nothing wrong with the extreme. Uh, we, uh, for users right now that have the Z690 or the Z790 extreme board, both of those still continue to be updated and they fully support uh, 14th gen. I've actually 
uh, already run the UEFI BIOS update. So again, if you have um, the Z690 Extreme or the Z790 Extreme, then you can just go ahead and download the latest UEFI and update that. Um, and again, if there's maybe new old stock that you find somewhere, they're still fantastic motherboards with an amazing set of features. And if you want to know more about those boards, you can watch our full in-depth live stream that we did for those boards, um, where I cover all those boards in, in detail, okay? So uh, DePoets, hey man, happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us here on the stream. So DePoets is giving some love. He said that's a very helpful feature. If you guys haven't, you guys should check out DePoets, a great uh, content creator on YouTube, on TikTok. He can give you some insight into, of course, PC DIY, overclocking, and a whole lot more. But nice to know that he appreciates uh, this design feature. And again, I think the cool thing is this is on even the entry level model with the Tough Gaming Z790, right? All right, guys. So that is going to cover us when it comes to the tough gaming board so i'm going to go ahead and recap again quickly uh the differences and then we'll get ready to go into our next board all right so let me go ahead and see right there uh, any quick questions uh which of the new motherboards has two uh, front uh, headers so yeah so that's actually that's a good one um, in most situations generally uh, for front headers you're gonna need to go up to the higher end series so like the hero tape for instance will have dual front USB 3 headers actually the Strix also can have a uh, dual front USB 3 headers but it's important to differentiate between legacy so uh, if we go back to our board right here so there are going to be, of course, your new USB-C header, and then you're going to have your legacy USB 3. So we do actually have models that will have actually the dual legacy USB 3, uh, but no models that will have dual internal USB-C. But there's very few chassis that have that. Like we're one of the only manufacturers with, like the Hyperion that actually has dual internal USB-C. Um, you can always add in an add-in card if you really want to, which is an inexpensive option. It might be cheaper than you buying all the way up to a new model that actually has that type of feature support. But we will get into essentially covering models that do um, note essentially, um, excuse me, that do show you essentially dual front USB. Um, but let me quickly show an image here. So, so, so if somebody is wondering kind of like, what do they mean here? I can show you here. So let's quickly go to the Dark Hero because the Dark Hero will have this. And here you guys can see, here's the Dark Hero board. And uh, you'll see right here that there's one internal USB -C, a USB header that's a legacy header, and then there's another USB C legacy, excuse me, another uh, legacy USB header. So you have the USB C, then legacy USB three, and legacy USB three. So if you wanted dual, you could go up to something like the Hero. Okay. All right. Now, uh, before we finish that off, though, I do want to go ahead and show one other cool feature. So, of course, many of you probably know what this guy is all about, right? So this is um, this is actually the revised antenna that we uh, create that we released a while back ago, um, but it was still using an SMA based connector. So essentially, this is going to be a, uh, a threaded connector. So you actually have to screw it in. And so most of you probably are familiar with seeing this on a motherboard. Um, if I go ahead and bring an older motherboard even our older maximus board you'll see here that these are the threaded connectors so we'll go under the secondary camera and we'll show you actually the difference between the new design that we're going to have which is called q antenna and then the older design so let's go ahead and take a look here so uh, it doesn't matter um, i'm using this maximus board as a diff as a, as a model but pretty much all wi-fi has been pretty much the same in this respect so if we take a look right here Go ahead and see if I can focus that in. There we go. Okay. You'll see those are actually threaded connectors. And so normally what you would end up doing is you would kind of take that connector and then you would screw it on. It takes usually about like five turns. So you can see right there. But then sometimes you would end up with this where the <laughs> you would twist the cable and sometimes you, you it could be a little bit kind of twisted. It could be a little bit weird, right? So same thing there. Okay, so now I've gone ahead and put both of them in and you'll see that that's what I kind of got. I got this like little twisted kind of weird knot, right? That's happened there just from kind of the, the, the uh, screwing them in. You can also have the issue that if you don't actually connect these, 
fully flush, you can actually have interference and signaling issues, which actually can affect the performance of your actual Wi-Fi. So you do actually need to make sure that they are fully connected. Um, also, a lot of people don't realize that these are required you actually need to connect the antenna to make sure your Bluetooth is operating correctly. So what we did for this new generation is we actually changed the design. So we actually have something that we call our Q antenna. So let's go ahead and take a look at the new Q antenna. All right, so here you guys can see This is gonna be the new antenna right here. So this is actually a push fit connector as opposed to your threaded connector, okay? And so this is a much, much easier way to be able to go ahead and connect the Wi-Fi. So let's go ahead and now just see how that would connect on our Tough Gaming motherboard. Now this one right here, uh, on the Tough Gaming, it's gonna be Wi-Fi 6E, so it still will offer very, very fast actually speeds. Uh, if you pair this up with the Wi-Fi 6E router, you can still actually get over gigabit ethernet speeds. You can actually get you know, anywhere between about 1,000 to about almost 1,500 megabits, so 1.5 gigabits. So you'll see right there, there's the connectors, and all I need to do is just push that in and it snaps in, and then pushes in and it snaps in. So that's it. And it does have a little bit of essentially like a magnetic design here. So there is a little bit of a threshold that it doesn't just pop out. So if you notice it right here, if I'm tugging, and we also do have strain relief that we'll see right here that we've put on the cable. So there's strain relief to mitigate you actually damaging that. But I actually have to kind of pull it out and then it will pull off. But you can see really, really simple to be able to go ahead and connect. So it's a really, really nice kind of streamlined design. So again, all I need to do is just push down on that connector, push down on that connector, and then that's it. So really simple, right? So you can see how long did it take me to do the other one? The other one wasn't really that long, right? I still was able to clearly do it under a minute, but for sure, this is going to be easier. You get less cable uh, management. And of course, just removing it, you don't have to worry generally about getting that knotting. It's just really simple, really nice. And again, all of the motherboards that we're going to talk about today all have this Q antenna design. So when you see Q antenna, what does that mean? That's actually what that means is that again, I can just pull that out, pull that out, and that's it. So really, really simple, really easy, a really nice option. So a very, very simple route. So that's going to again be the Q antenna design. Okay. You just want to push in until you hear the click, push in until you hear the click, and then that's it. You're good to go. So very, very nice, very easy, very simple. Hey, Mods by Ben. Thanks for joining us on the stream. Janny is giving us some feedback right here. Khalid is giving us some feedback. So uh, Mods is Mods by Ben's telling us so creative. Uh, we've also got uh, Dang. I like that. Uh, nice feature. I'm loving it. Excellent feature. Uh, nice magnetic lash design. Yeah, overall, it's definitely, I think, a really nice uh, just option to be able to just simplify and improve the overall cable connection experience, right? So there you guys go. That is going to be the Q connector design. Uh, excuse me, the Q antenna design, uh, even here on the Tough Gaming motherboard, it will still have that feature, okay? So that's another innovation, and that's really what Asus is known for, you know? I mean, we are really kind of the industry leader at offering so many of these cool kind of subtle small things that do make the build experience just that much better, um, that much easier, that much simpler. So that is all part of our Q design philosophy. So um, you know, again, we showed off there, what did we have? We had the QLED with the dim detect, the Q release, the Q latch, right? Uh, the integrated Q shield, right? There's so many of these different design features that we introduce to really try to be able to improve the experience uh, for the PC DIY builder. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and just recap here on the quick differences uh, for the Tough Gaming Board before we get ready to go into the ROG Strix models, okay? so. Let me go ahead and bring this up here. And um, I will also show you something that's uh, really quick before we get into the ROG Strix model. For the Q antenna design, we also have a new updated software suite that's actually pretty cool. It will help you within the Armor Crate software to actually point the antenna in the right direction. So it actually accounts for directionality, can give you signal strength information. So if you actually make adjustments, you can help to improve the overall experience when it comes to your actual Wi-Fi as well. So taking again a look here, 
In terms of what we have for the difference, again, the Tough Gaming Z790 Pro will be coming in at $50 above the Z790 Plus, so $299, $99, essentially $300. What are those upgrades? Uh, the aesthetic. The DDR5 overclocking, very solid. I can tell you already, I can't give you 14th gen information. Make sure to watch later, later's stream. But I can tell you already with 13th gen, I ran no problems, 7,000 MT, which I think for a lot of people will probably be even higher than what they would probably pair with a Tough Gaming motherboard, but no problems running 7,000 MT with like a 13th gen series CPU. Um, 20 gigabits internal USB-C, Asus AIOC technology, the AI cooling technology, the AMP technology for uh, easy, essentially non-XMP based DDR5 overclocking, the Q antenna design, the QLED with the dim detect, and then that PCIe slot layout revision. Okay, so those are going to be all of the items uh, that we have there uh, when it comes to the Tough Gaming Board. Okay, so um, if anybody has any other quick questions on the Tough Gaming Board, feel free to go ahead and drop them in the chat. If not, we're going to get ready to go into our first board on the RG Strix side, which is gonna be the RG Strix Dash A, okay? So give me one second here. Um, we might might still hold on to this one because I might end up uh, using this a little bit later for a demo if we have a little bit of time. I wanna see if I can show you guys the AMP feature. Uh, we'll show you, uh, we'll, we'll just show it to you with a 13th gen series CPU. Um, and in case anybody's wondering, some people like to see the box. This is what the box looks like. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, I do want to show you guys just something small. And we'll show you this actually on uh, another ROG Strix board. But one change that we also went ahead and made uh, for this generation is... The support documentation has changed a little bit. So uh, Tough Gaming, you still get your basic things like uh, you're going to get your cool little Tough Gaming stickers. I love these. These are really ni they're very nice quality stickers, actually. Um, but one of the cool things that we did is we revised our quick start guide and we essentially revised the manual. So if you need the full manual, you can go to the website and you can download the manual. But now it's a much smaller piece of documentation on the RG ones. It's actually going to be in color, which is pretty cool. But we actually have a cool little guide. So let me show this to you quickly. So if we actually take a look here at our quick support document, um, you'll see that the immediate kind of top level guide might be quite a bit more useful to, I think, builders out there when they're trying to figure out what's kind of going on as far as where all the connectors are. So you can see right there, we've gone ahead and called out immediately in that first visual, just where all of your physical connectors are so you can easily reference that. So I think this is actually a bit easier. You can see then there's a immediate QR code that you can scan with your phone if you need to be able to go ahead and pull up the manual information. Um, and then you have um, more kind of just immediate guidance right here on installing things like your CPU, uh, installing your memory, installing the cooler, uh, the M.2 SSD, right? And then some of the other kind of key specifics uh, for the rest of your system. So instead of having like a whole manual where you might, you don't really kind of need a lot of that information, um, although I always recommend actually reading through the manual, we now have just a little bit more of a focused quick start guide, okay? So that is gonna be a cool little uh, kind of item, just note of a difference. And uh, if I didn't show you the sticker, there's the sticker pack for the Tough Gaming for this generation, okay? All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the ROG Strix boards, guys. I know, tell me in the chat, are you uh, are you team ROG Strix? Or are you team Tough Gaming? Or are you team Maximus? All right, let's, let's know, which team are you on? All right, so that is gonna be that. Let's go ahead and take a look here at our ROG Strix boards, so. One second here. Okay, so for our ROG Strix series, we're gonna have three models for the refresh. So we're gonna have the ROG Strix Z790-A, we're gonna have the ROG Strix uh, Z790-F, and then we're gonna have the ROG Strix Z790-E, and they're all gonna be the Wi-Fi 2. So keep that in mind, there will all be two designation, okay? so. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at these three. So we already made the announcement for this one right here, which is going to be the ROG Strix Dash A in white. 
right? Again, that's going to be our white silver theme. Then there's going to be the Z790-F gaming Wi-Fi, and then there's going to be the ROG Strix Z790-E gaming Wi-Fi. Um, I did forget to note there Wi-Fi 2. So keep in mind, all of these models, it's going to be Wi-Fi 2 is going to be the designation difference because uh, the non-2 is essentially the original model. So uh, some of the cool things that you're going to get here with these ROG Strix models as we talk about them is across the board, um, if we just kind of no note some high level kind of consistent items between them, all of them are going to support actually uh, five M.2 SSDs. So that's going to be an upgrade already from the Tough Gaming. So you go from four to automatically all of them will support five. Um, all of them are going to support that ASUS AIOC technology. All of them are going to come with Wi-Fi 7. All of them will have 2.5 gigabit networking. All of them have Supreme FX isolated audio design. They all have at least 20 gigabits USB uh, connectivity on those boards. So you can already see that really they offer a great foundation. They're all going to have the Q release design. You can see there's a Q release, there's the Q release, there's the Q release. Another update that we also previously made is that all of these models will have a clear CMOS button on the rear. So even going down to the Dash A, historically we used to reserve the clear CMOS only for the Dash E, but we've gone ahead and moved that down. So you now actually, for overclockers, you can have that little bit more of that benefit. Also for troubleshooting, having that clear CMOS can be advantageous as well. So they all have that functionality as well. So those are all gonna be consistent points between all of them. All right, but we'll talk about the differences between each one of them and how they compare to their prior generations. Okay, so let me go ahead and get our first board up here, which is gonna be the ROG Strix Z790-A Gaming Wi-Fi 2. Um, let me go ahead and actually also put, put the pricing here for this model. So give me one second. Um, this one should be 399. So let me go ahead and just make a little edit right there so that we can have the pricing. Okay, so that's going to be 399, and here's the box. All right, so we got our RG Strix Z790-A Gaming Wi-Fi 2. I love this. Uh, I'm putting it right next to, of course, our other white-themed motherboard, which we will still offer. We will still offer the Prime Series motherboard, so you still have that as an option if you want to go with that. So we're going to take this out, and I'm going to show you a couple of cool things. Now, one thing... Um, it's actually kind of cool. It's a little bit of a sleeper thing. You'll tell me guys in the chat how many of you noticed and I'm going to check in the chat if anybody has any new questions in a moment before we get into feature differences. But you saw that I had the ESD bag. We also do give you this little pad and I actually like using the pad because when I'm doing my setup, tell me if you guys in the chat, do you use your box for initially first setting up your build? If you do, what might you normally do? Well, you might put your motherboard down and then you might put excuse me you put the box and then you put the motherboard but sometimes the disadvantage of that is that of course the back of the pcb right you've got of course all of those little pins and you can scratch your box if you're part of the team that likes to protect their boxes and you want to keep your boxes all pristine then it's nice it's just a nice little subtle thing right you guys uh, normally see probably here when i'm doing these streams I have access to these really nice pcb boards that i use but you guys probably don't have any of these pcb boards right um so Overall, I think that's a nice little addition. Um, I'm also going to show you guys just a couple other little couple of things that come into the box really quick before we get into the feature differences. The antenna that we showed you, that Q antenna design, that antenna is also white. So if you're on that team white setup where you got to have everything that's trying to look really, really consistent, uh, even the antenna now for this generation is white. So that is pretty cool because in the prior generation, the antenna was still black. Okay. Um, a couple of other little small changes that we made here too in terms of the packaging. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I know some people like to know this information. So you still get your ROG right here. This is going to be your keychain. All of the accessories come in just one bag right here. So there's going to be actually your SATA cables, um, a secondary thermal pad, some zip ties. Um, you got the ROG stickers. Really nice again, these really nice stickers. Okay. And then again, your quick start guide, but you'll notice here, if we look at, take a look here at the quick start guide, quick start guide this time around is in color. Ooh, 
color, right? So very, really easy, just nice reference for that quick start guide, okay? All right, all right, enough of that, enough of the box. Let's go ahead and now take a closer look at this model and what the differences are, okay? So we'll go ahead and throw this one up here. I'll also go ahead and connect the RGB lighting so you guys can see this a little bit closer up in terms of the RGB lighting for this one. So RG Strix G790-A, there we go. Okay, so what's gonna be the difference here? Difference here for this model, so we can see right there. So what are you gonna have between the prior gen and between the new gen? So we can see the first thing is a little bit of an aesthetic revision. So overall, it's gonna be pretty similar, right? It's gonna be largely silver and white, and then you're gonna, of course, have your black contrast. It's a great choice, again, for a white-themed, silver-themed based build. Uh, another upgrade is going to be going up from that 4 to that 5 M.2 SSDs. Now keep in mind that uh, your 5 M.2 SSD slots, you don't have PCI Express Gen 5, so this is PCI Express Gen 4, but they all have M.2 heatsinks. So compared to like the Tough Gaming motherboard, which had four slots, but three had heatsinks, this one actually goes to all of them actually have heatsinks on there. This one you can also see it's going to give you Wi-Fi 7 with the Q antenna design, so that easy, quick antenna design. You're going to get that QLED with also the dim detect. You'll see that there's a little bit of a tweak here to the PCIe slot layout, which you can see right here. We actually had a physical by 16 slot. Of course, it's not electrically by 16, but you'll see that because, of course, the expanded M.2 SSD support, we had to actually make revisions there in terms of how the slot layout works. So there is a little bit of a different slot arrangement on the board. For most of you, though, this won't be a factor because most of you would probably be just having a GPU. It could be, of course, up to this three slots where it covers all this, and then you would essentially have that one slot available to you there. Um, in addition to that, the board actually also gets an upgrade from 10 rear USB ports to 12 USB ports. So there's now a total of 12 USB ports on the rear, and this one also supports AMP2, okay? Now, I didn't note AO ASUS AOC because already all ROG Strix motherboards came with ASUS AOC. There's a lot of other things that ROG Strix boards already come with. We might touch a little bit on those things, but this is just what's new. So I'm not covering essentially things that already were included with the board previously. This is essentially what is new. So let's go ahead and take a closer look here at the board. I'm gonna also quickly take a look here and see if we got any quick questions that might've came up. Um, question, will ASUS have some more high-end certified uh, memory? Um, I can't speak to if you're asking if we're gonna have any ROG certified memory. Um, that's something that we work with partners on. So companies like Gel or Corsair, Team Group, different partners. Um, but in terms of robust DDR5 memory support, the uh, memory support is gonna be very, very good. Um, Mike is going, where do I get a PCB board like that? Well, maybe if you're part of the PCDIY group, I'm actually thinking about maybe we'll do some limited giveaways for the group um, where we'll do some of these PCB giveaways. So just kind of keep it tuned there and we'll see that, okay? Um, so um, somebody asking about any micro ATX boards? No, no micro ATX boards uh, for this uh, refresh, okay? So we're just gonna be having essentially these boards. JJ, how can I tell if there are... Uh, so no, the naming is not the same. Remember, the naming is going to be Gaming Wi-Fi 2, okay? Is there a Dash E coming along? Yes. Also, yes. Uh, right now, we just started talking about the ROG Strix board. So the first one I'm going to cover is the Dash A. Then I'm going to come uh, talk about the Dash E. And then I'm going to talk, excuse me, talk about the Dash F. Then I will talk about the Dash E. Uh, Apex will also be covering in a little bit, okay? And uh, the formula, so somebody asking about the formula the Apex, we're gonna be covering those in a little bit, so don't worry. Um, as far as availability, like I talked about, probably about seven to 12 days, somewhere in that time frame. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a closer look here at the ROG Strix board. I'll do maybe a little bit of some peels here. Uh, let's also go ahead and show off a little bit of the cool lighting here. So let me get my cool little adapter here that lets me actually show you guys the lighting. So you can see a really nice, just clean, soft ROGI right there. It's got a nice little Mylar kind of material to it that gives it a nice little kind of sheen. Looks really good. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do that peel right there. Is the formula an a, uh, ATX? Yes, so actually all the boards are ATX. There's no EATX. The only EATX board that we had was just the Extreme. So both the, um, the Hero, the Formula, and the Apex will all be essentially ATX based boards in terms of their dimensions, okay? So, um, got a couple other little peels right here. We'll just kind of peel that for you guys. You can kind of take a look right there. 
but you can see really, really nice, just clean design, right? And you can see one M.2 SSD, you've got another M.2 SSD, another M.2 SSD, another M.2 SSD, another M.2 SSD. So as I noted, right, in total, you're gonna have a comprehensive five M.2 SSDs on this board. You also get the Q release design on this board. So that easy ejection mechanism that's gonna be on here. So that's gonna be really nice, right? You get the Q antenna design. Now, um, one thing that you'll actually notice right here is that this internal header, that USB 3 header, is actually a reinforced header. So um, if we do compare that to the Tough Gaming board, this is a little bit of an area where, again, where we kind of upgrade just some premium elements. If you take a look here at the Tough Gaming board, you'll see right there, there's the header. But then you can see the header right there. It's actually got that silver around it. That silver is actually a reinforced header. Um, we actually have been doing that for a while, like on the power connections. So if you actually look at the power connections right here, so these are the actual power connectors. You'll actually see right there, those are our Procool power connectors. Uh, they actually have a reinforced housing, okay? And they also have solid pins on there for improved uh, current handling, better actually efficiency as well. But that's a reinforced header because sometimes with that legacy cable, it could sometimes actually shear the actual physical housing off. I've actually had people that have showed me, hey, I plug in the connector, I pull it out, and they literally pulled the plastic off of the motherboard. Um, they disconnected it. So that's actually, that's a reinforced header. So it's just a little bit more of a premium design on the board, okay? So that is something else to note of. Another little thing that will be kind of just subtle, um, but you'll start to see on the ROG Strix boards. So you can see right here, that there's actually a protector. So right here we have the CPU fan header and here's the CPU OPT header. You can actually see if I remove this, there's actually a little rubber protection cap. So that little cap actually helps to make sure that those pins sometimes don't get bent or ba uh, damaged. Sometimes you get some people and they're installing things, they push these things and they push the, the headers down. Um, so they're essentially very small, but that's another little thing that you'll see that kind of is coming there with the board. So just if you're wondering about that, if you don't go like, I can't see all the headers, actually some of the headers are protected, right? They actually have covers on them. So do keep that in mind. So again, that's a little kind of protector for the header. So I'm just going to put that back on there. There's one for that CPU fan header, and this is one for the CPU OPT fan header, okay? So there you can see the overall design. Very nice, very clean. Okay. Um, in terms of kind of your rest of your connectors, nothing kind of too much to note. Um, the audio is going to be upgraded compared to the Tough Gaming series. This is going to have, of course, uh, the Supreme Effects audio codec, so it has a much more comprehensive software suite. It also has a Savvy Tech amp, which is going to be a higher grade amp that's going to be on board. But I do want to actually show you guys here the M.2 SSD because there is one thing. So when we compared uh, to the Tough Gaming board, we, of course, saw that we had the Q... The Q um, the Q latch design, right? But here we can actually see the difference where I was talking about that on that M.2 SSD, here you can see that you have essentially a dual contact design. So you have the heatsink here and you have the thermal pad. And then here you have the heatsink and a thermal pad. So there's actually contact on the front and on the back. So again, if we go back to our tough gaming board and we take a look right there, you have that really easy M.2 SSD design in terms of actually installing it. It works great. And again, uh, you can you have very good thermal dissipation performance from the heatsink that also comes with the actual, um, with the board, but the ROG boards will start to offer this type of also design. Now, as you get to higher end boards, we'll even have multiple uh, dual contact designs. So not every single slot will be on here. So if you notice like here, if I go down to these bottom slots, let me go ahead and move up here a little bit. Okay. You'll also see one thing that we did, and we already have done this now for a couple of generations, but the screws here on the heat sinks, they're captive. So if you notice, they don't they don't come off. So you don't have to worry about kind of losing that screw. It's a captive screw, so it'll stay on the heat sink. But if you notice right there, you can see here, right? 
here's one M.2 SSD slot, here's another M.2 SSD slot, here's another M.2 SSD slot, right? This one, of course, is giving you the Q latch design, so very easy design to be able to put it in, but it's not a dual contact, okay? But generally, you only would want dual contact for like the highest performing drives, so like the absolute fastest Gen 4 drives, or of course, the new PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSDs, that's where ideally you would want to do that, or very high density drives, because very high density drives, they can have NAND on the, the back, and also on the front so they can benefit essentially from additional thermal dissipation okay so that is going to be the rog strix z6 z790 a gaming wi-fi 2 um, and overall that's going to account for i think pretty much most of the key elements that you're going to have uh, a nice really solid upgrade for a lot of people here i do want to show off the rear io uh, we'll show an image off of it but i'll also show it right here on video just to kind of you can kind of see right there but uh, let me go ahead and see right there, see if you can see it. So you can see very, very nice rear IO configuration. So you've got your clear CMOS right there, USB BIOS flashback, DP, HDMI. You can see right there, four USB, those are USB 2, then five gigabits USB, right? Then you've got right there, uh, you're gonna have a 20 gigabits USB-C, another 10 gigabits USB, another 10 gigabit USB-C, another uh, USB, Type A, that's going to be a 10, a 2.5G, and then again the quick antenna design. So that's that push fit antenna design, and then your um, multi channel audio with optical. So you can see that's going to be 4, 8, 10, 12, 12 ports on the ROG Strix A gaming Wi Fi 2. So even though this is the entry Strix board, ah, that's a lot of rear USB. Really, really nice, really great overall I.O. design, okay? And uh, very, very robust uh, VRM design also on this model. Again, I'm not going to touch on it too much. You don't have to worry about it. The power delivery on all of these motherboards is going to be very high grade, stable, reliable, and efficient. So it doesn't matter whether you're going to run running stock or overclock, you're going to be able to have a great experience. Now, the power delivery design as we move up from the Tough Gaming to the RG Strix models will be higher. And as we even go to the RG Maxima series, they will, of course, have the highest NVRMs, which is not just... Just the number of power stages, the amperage, but the capacitors and the inductors, all of that gets an upgrade. And even the PCB design is higher grade with more layers. Also it goes to a low loss PCB design as well. So there's numerous kind of design benefits uh, that you get in that respect. If somebody has questions on that, feel free and ask. But um, really for the most part, it's not something you have to kind of be conscious about or be super worried about in terms of the power delivery. Because again, uh, even from that tough gaming model, they're all gonna be very, very performant, okay? All right, so we're gonna to go to the next model, which is gonna be the Dash F. So give me one second here, and we'll pop in the Dash F. Um, I'm also gonna put in the pricing for the Dash F. So Dash F is gonna be 429. Dash F, I think, is going to be very popular for a lot of you guys. So let's go ahead and bring this one up here. All right, so moving up, what do we get? So here you, of course, move into a black-themed base motherboard. You can see, again, the prior generation between the... Uh, excuse me, between the Z790 original, so essentially no Wi-Fi, not no Wi-Fi 2, right? Just essentially version one and then the second version. So what are gonna be your upgrades? Uh, pretty straightforward, right? Just like the other boards that we've talked about, you're gonna be moving up to an aesthetic update, five M.2 SSD slots. Still, those are all gonna be PCI Express Gen 4, so no Gen 5. Um, you're gonna also have the DimFlex support. DimFlex feature I'm going to talk about is a very cool feature. Um, now, I didn't note it on the other boards, but the other boards do have this, but it's a really, really cool feature, and we will talk about it uh, because uh, I think for those of you that really are excited about DDR5 overclocking, this may be one of the coolest features that we've had since something like Dynamic OC Switcher. So I think it will be a very exciting feature for many of you that are interested in maximizing DDR5 overclocking and also improving st stability. All right. Um, Wi-Fi 7, again, with the Q antenna design, uh, PCIe slot layout revision, and then more USB ports as well. This one is going to be giving you uh, your 12 USB ports and then also AMP2. So overall, pretty similar uh, to kind of like the Dash A, but we do also get a couple of other things. Keep in mind that when we're looking at this board, take, for instance, some of the upgrades that you might see is 
this board also has a start button, right? Where the prior board didn't have a, let's say, start button, right? So that's an example of, again, I'm not talking about the immediate differences just between like the dash A and the dash F. There are other spec upgrades that you're gonna have there, but that's an example of kind of where they differentiate. Here, I'm immediately comparing just the prior dash, excuse me, the dash F to the dash F. This actually says dash A, my apologies. That's an error on my side. Um, I'll see if I can quickly uh, revise that, but um, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and go over here to the dash F. So let me go ahead and get the dash F guys. Now your board will not come with that. Your board will look a little bit different. That's just because uh, this was uh, an engineering sample that I have here for the, for the, for the demo. that allow you guys to kind of see it. Really great looking design. I really love this just nice clean RGI. All right, so let's go ahead and just take a closer look right here. All right, there we go. And that gives us the dash F. You can see overall same kind of really nice just design aesthetic that we have with that nice just kind of clean large ROGI, a little bit of that uh, kind of diffuse in, in there with that LED strip to give it a nice kind of softness, which I think is quite nice. Okay. Uh, you still have the same little kind of protectors that are going to be on here. Still three ARGB headers they are going to be on there. You can see that you've got the start button on there. You still also have the reinforced USB 3 header that's also going to be on there. You also have, of course, the uh, Q release, right? Because like I said, all of those things are going to be contingent, excuse me, consistent between all the motherboards. You won't see that there's going to be any difference between them. They'll all have that same design implementation, right? Um, the heatsink will even be a little bit larger on this model. Uh, for the actual primary M.2 SSD, but uh, it's not, again, a uh, large differential, but it's just something that kind of, if you're wondering about it, it is gonna be a little bit larger right here. And then we'll move down here. I really like this cool little kind of gradient pattern. I think this looks really, really nice. There you guys go. And I uh, didn't touch on it, but uh, the boards do have them. Let me see if I can show you guys right down here. Uh, you should have the, let's see, where is it? Right here, this header right here is gonna be on the boards. Um, so all the Maximus series, they do have Thunderbolt except for the Apex, but this is a Thunderbolt 4 header. So if you do wanna be able to support Thunderbolt 4 on this board or the Dash A, uh, or actually even the Tough Gaming SKU, you have the Thunderbolt 4 header, so you can get our Thunderbolt 4 expansion card. So that will allow you to go ahead and add that, even though this board by default does not have the Thunderbolt connectivity. And again, this one, just like the Dash A, will have the dual contact based design. So again, I'll just show that to you for reference, right? Where you can see, again, there's that dual contact design, right? One heatsink one thermal pad, one's heat sink, one thermal pad. And this one will be just like the Dash A where you'll have up to five M.2 SSDs. Again, no PCI Express Gen 5. Uh, that will be on our next one with the Dash E, okay? And you can see right there, another two and then another two. So that's where your total of five is. And again, here you still have that same kind of design sensibility that we talked about compared to some of the other competitors in the marketplace where um, I think that, again, you've had a little bit of, you know, maybe a diff different kind of perspective in terms of the thermal, ba ther thermal balancing is with our design right here, we have one always isolated. And then here, this space, we've tried to mitigate having an M.2 directly underneath there. And they're more isolated, just like what we showed on the Tough Gaming Board. So again, even here, if I put my 4070, you can actually see right here, those are still accessible. And on top of that, they're more isolated where some competitors directly, that one or two M.2 SSDs are gonna be right underneath the actual graphics card, right? Okay, so that's gonna be the ROG Strix Z790-A, excuse me, dash F, as opposed to the dash A. 
Uh, we'll take a look at the images to show you guys the I, the I.O. But um, let me go ahead and just show you kind of the rear I.O. so you can see it. Turn a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we can see right here from the bottom right, we've got optical gold-plated uh, audio connectors, Wi-Fi 7, of course, which is also going to be for the Bluetooth uh, 5.4. You can then see right there, you've got your USB-C, you've got another USB-C, so this is 10 gigabits, 20 gigabits. That's going to be two ports right there, 2.5G networking, four ports right there. Those are going to be two USB-2, right? And then these are going to be high speed, so 20 gigabits and 10 gigabits. Then you're going to go up and you're going to get four more five gigabits ports, and then you're gonna get four more USB 2 ports. So that's gonna be a total there if we count. It's gonna be four, eight, uh, and right there, excuse me, you can see another, right? That's gonna be 12, right? Excuse me, uh, yeah, four, eight, 12, and then you got two more right there, so total 14, right? So it's a huge level of connectivity available on the board. You got your HDMI. Uh, you're also gonna actually have DP on this one as well with the clear CMOS and the USB BIOS flashback. So the Dash F is a really, really great value if you're just looking for tons of USB ports, tons of M.2, really great overclocking board, that Wi-Fi 7. Um, you know, this is gonna be a hard board to beat for its overall, I think, kind of value proposition. Um, if you're really kind of just looking for a lot of the spec minus something, maybe like I said, like a, um, uh, PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD support. So let me quickly go ahead and see if there was any quick questions that might have come up right there. Um, hey, JJ, uh, Asus doesn't show the old hero. Um, yes, so uh, yes, Bobby's asking right here. I did cover this earlier in the stream that yes, all of the Socket 1700 series motherboards have all received UEFI BIOS updates to be able to enable support for um, 14th gen series CPUs. So again, if you have, um, you had our Prime Z790 AHA, you have the ProArt based motherboard, if you have the prior dark, uh, excuse me, if you have the prior hero, not the dark hero, or even a Z690 series motherboards, all of them uh, will receive the UEFI BIOS support, okay? So you're gonna be really solid in that regard, okay? So overall, this is, I think, a really, really solid option uh, for, I think, a lot of people right here. Um, let me go ahead and just show you again here a recap of the images that we'll have for the, uh, excuse me, for the dash A and the dash E. So let's go right here. So we'll go, excuse me, dash F. Um, so right here, I gave you the little flyover, but we'll just take a look at this so you can, guys can see the, the rear I.O. very cleanly. So there you go, there's your rear I.O. for the dash F. So again, you can see four, eight, 12, right, 14. And this is 20 gigabits, that's 10 gigabits, that's 10 gigabits, the USB 2, all the black ones are USB 2, that's the USB BIOS flashback port, clear CMOS, uh, of course, Wi-Fi 7 with Bluetooth, optical out, multi-channel along with the Supreme FX isolated audio design, and then 2.5 gigabit. Um, if we compare that, if you want to see here, let's just quickly show you, uh, compare that to the dash A. We can quickly compare that to the dash A. So we can show kind of both side by side. Although I think probably we're going to have two different sets of people, right? Because one is white and one is black. But there you go, you can see the difference between the dash A and the dash F, right? Still both very, very nice in terms of the IO, okay? So now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go to the dash E, all right? And let me confirm the pricing here for the dash E, okay?
Oh, actually, give me one second. Let me adjust that right there, guys. Apologies. There we go. Okay. All right, so the RG Strix E is going to be coming in at $4.99, and we'll go ahead and grab that board there. And again, I didn't show the Q antenna design, but it's going to, of course, be on there just like uh, the other boards, because as I noted, that is going to be a consistent feature point across all of the boards, right? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look here at this dash E board. And we'll take a look at what's going to be different first. All right, here we go, guys. Okay, so coming in at $4.99 compared to the Dash F, which was $4.29, okay? Here you can see that you're going to get an aesthetic upgrade. Uh, the VRM has also been upgraded. Now, the VRM was already very high spec, very high performing again. So, again, no issues running stock or overclocked on this model, but you're going to go up to 110 amp. Uh, Power stage is going to be on here. Five M.2 SSDs uh, will be on this model. This one will give you, though, PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD support, though. So that keep in mind, that's a difference, right? So the Dash F and the Dash A both gave you five, but this one will give you also one PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD. You get, of course, the Wi-Fi 7 with the Q antenna, the QLED with the DIMM detect, a uh, revised PCI slot layout. There's actually more rear 10 USB 10 gigabits ports. Also, critically, down here, you may not notice, but there's actually here, there's two USB 2 internal headers. And here, this board actually has three internal USB 2 headers. And so that can be useful for those of you that run lots of kind of internal controllers, right? So you've got maybe something like our Strix LC or maybe like a Ryogen 2. Maybe you've got like a tough gaming set of fans that then may plug in there. Or maybe you got an optional USB controller. Maybe you're using something from another company, right? But you need those USB 2 internal headers. Most boards usually have two. This one actually has three internal USB 2 headers. So some people, they end up having to buy like a little hub module to plug into one of those headers to give them more internal USB 2 ports. This one is already going to give you essentially three. So uh, aesthetic upgrade, VRM upgrade, 5M.2 SSDs with PCI Express Gen 5, uh, right? Uh, the DIMMflex support, the Wi-Fi 7, the QLED, the revised PCI slot layout, 10 gigabits ports, three internal USB 2 headers. So that is gonna be pretty sweet in terms of everything that that board is bringing to the table. Uh, let's go ahead and take a closer look at that one. So give me one second here um, and we will bring that one up. So give me one moment. And let me grab that board, put away this dash F. just bumped my camera. Hopefully my camera's all right there. Okay. There we go. And uh, feel free if anybody has any questions. After the Dash E, we will be looking at Maximus. So for all of those excited about, of course, the Dark Hero, um, excited about the apex, excited about the formula. We will be talking about those in just a little bit, okay? All right, so there we go. We're gonna have the dash E now here. So give me one sec. We'll swap over to a second camera and we'll take a look right here. Okay, so there we go. Uh, uh, let me adjust that. I think we bumped it a little bit there. There it goes. Okay. All right, so there we go from the top, right? Uh, pretty similar, right, to the dash F, right? Um, peel that just so you guys don't think it looks like that, right? Again, has the 
This one's really cool because it's actually got a little bit of this kind of dual kind of um, embossed nature right here with just a little bit of kind of gloss. So there's a two tone. So there's a matte and then there's a little bit of a subtle gloss. It gives you a nice kind of gradient kind of uh, between the black in there that I think looks really, really nice. And this is slightly inset. So it actually seems like it's on the inside, which is pretty slick uh, overall. Really, really nice design, I think, on this board. Just looks really clean. Uh, very much, of course, in the vibe of everything that we do within, of course, ROG Strix, right? You get the same things in terms of those nice little caps right there. Three RGB headers. Uh, you do step up to things like the debug LED display on here, but you still also get the QLED with the dim detect technology. You, of course, have the start button that's also on this board. You get the reinforced USB header. Of course, if we scroll down, uh, you can see right there, you of course have the Q release for the ejection. Um, you'll now you'll see on this board, this board has a much larger heat sink for the primary M.2 SSD slot. And the reason why this one's even larger than the, of course the prior model, and I'll show you here from the side profile just how much bigger it is. You can see right there that there's a whole, essentially uh, there's a heat pipe. So you'll see actually right there, there's a multi-stage heat sink, and then there's actually a heat pipe that connects to this large portion. So this is a very, very large and dense heat sink. Um, and that's because this primary slot is gonna be designed for PCI Express Gen 5. So these latest generation PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSDs, you really want to make sure that they're very much under our ADC, um, because if they don't, they will actually thermal rotto consistently and you won't be getting that maximum performance. Although in of course real world workloads, you generally are not gonna be seeing the same type of sequential performance you had when you benchmark a drive. But um, you do wanna make sure that these drives are essentially well cooled to be able to ensure that they get the best performance performance. So that is a big upgrade here is that you just get a much larger, much dense, much denser uh, heatsink for the actual primary M.2 SSD. So you also have that dual contact design, five M.2 SSDs that can be supported on here. If you roll down to the bottom, you can also see right here that you've got one, two, three, three internal USB 2. Um, some people might not know what this little switch is right here, but this is actually pretty cool. This is an alteration mode switch. And so what this actually allows you to do is that if you were gonna use a riser cable, this will actually let you to toggle between different PCI Express operating modes for that riser cable. So you could go from like Gen 5, excuse me, well, Gen 4 to Gen 3. Um, normally you would end up having to kind of remove the riser cable or default to the integrated graphics or do kind of like a whole rigor roll of having to go into the UEFI, change settings to be able to resolve the issues you might have with the riser cables. But now you can just use this toggle switch uh, for that and it'll do it without you having to remove anything. So this can be really, really handy in terms of troubleshooting or resolving riser cable based issues. Um, you can also use this switch as a toggle in the UEFI for fan control. So if you actually wanna have fan control like a low, medium or high, you could have like low, medium or high speed in terms of your fans and you can just toggle uh, with that. You have to change a switch in the UEFI to instead of have this working for the PCIe, then you would have it work for your fan control, but you can do that as well. Um, same thing. Premium high grades of Premium FX isolated audio design with, of course, the Sonic Studio software suite. Also, of course, uh, you get um, uh, improvement in terms of the Sabitech uh, amp that's going to be on there as well. So overall, really, really nice upgrade. I think probably for a lot of people is going to be the sweet spot for like the high end enthusiast board. It's a really, really great choice. I mean, the Hero has an amazing set of features and functions that are really, really cool. But I think this is gonna be a great choice for a lot of people that are looking out there. So uh, let's go ahead and quickly take a look here at the IO for the Dash E. And we'll also see if we can have anybody to have any questions. And then from there, I'm also gonna actually show you guys a little bit of information about the DIM Flex technology. So give me one second here. But let's go ahead and take a look at the Dash E. So here you guys can see the board, just kind of nice clean image of it. And again, you have that reinforced USB 3 header, right, that we showed on the other models, that very high performance upgraded VRM assembly, again, stock or overclocked, you're not gonna have any issues, it's gonna be a great board in terms of that. It does have ASUS AOC, but all the boards that we're talking about all have ASUS AOC. You'll see right here all the M.2 SSD slots, and this one also has that dual contact. So when we move into the Maximus, the Maximus boards you're going to see start to have multiple dual contact M.2 SSD slots. So if that's something that's really important to you to have the most thermal performance for your M.2 SSDs, that will be a differentiation point, but we'll touch on that when we get to the Maximus boards. 
And there you can see on the rear I.O., compared to like the Dash F or the Dash A where you saw some USB 2 ports, here you're going to see that all of the ports are essentially high speed. So you can see uh, that's 10 gigabit ports, 10 gigabit ports, uh, 10 gigabit ports, right? Uh, that's a USB BIOS flashback port, but that's 10 gigabits, 20 gigabits, and 10 gigabits. So it's 2, 4, 8, so that's going to be 10, 12, so 12 total ports, clear CMOS, USB BIOS flashback, HDMI, DP, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, Wi-Fi 7 with Bluetooth, and then your optical with full multi-channel audio output as well. So uh, great I.O. So this is a really, really great choice. I mean, it's going to be hard to beat, I think, for most people in terms of you really needing to go into the Maximus unless you want some of those really cool Maximus level features. And there's some really cool stuff. But again, for a lot of people, this, um, I think, is going to be a really great choice to really kind of give you everything you're looking for. And uh, the stickers in here are awesome. They actually have like kind of like synth wave color vibe to them, which I think are really nice. We also do give you some nice extras included like an extra thermal pad for your M.2 SSDs. Um, you still get the nice keychain. You get zip ties in there. Of course, you get your SATA cables, um, some uh, auxiliary items there for M.2 SSDs, and then of course the same Q antenna design, okay? So that is going to be the ROG Strix Z790-E gaming Wi-Fi. So before I get to Maximus, let me go ahead and bring up some information on the Dim, uh, Dimplex design. And then I'm also gonna quickly just see if anybody has any quick questions on uh, the Strix boards before we get into the Maximus series boards, okay? So give me one second here, guys, to just put this board away. And uh, for anybody that's also looking for performance information, again, we're gonna have a live stream later this week that we'll do actually overclocking demo, DDR5 uh, demo. We also will have upcoming videos. We're actually gonna be doing some performance testing with each one of the boards so that you guys, if you guys want second confidence like outside of the QVL, I'm actually gonna be showing OC results for each one of the boards along with DRAM validation information. So you can feel kind of even more confident and comfortable in terms of the performance of the boards. So uh, that will be coming up in the not too distant future. But um, let me go ahead and bring up this here for the Dimplex. So the really cool thing that with Dimplex is, is that what a lot of people don't realize when you talk about DDR5 memory is that uh, temperature actually matters. So one of the really interesting things that actually happens when you talk about actually overclocking DDR5 memory is there's actually two different things that come into play. One is uh, temperature. Um, so one of the cool things that happened with DDR5 is all DDR5 modules have actually advanced reporting that actually allows you to provide uh, a readout to the actual temperature for the actual module. Um, this can be advantageous because generally the cooler the memory module generally the better it is at being able to hit higher frequencies with more stability, especially under sustained workloads. You may not realize, but over time, of course, the module will heat up um, as more actually data is being passed through. That can also be a factor, of course, as you also increase voltage, which generally overclocked DIMMs are running higher voltages than your default standard, right? All of those factors come into play. Um, also, what's called memory training, which happens when your system starts up, can actually be influenced by temperature. So one of the really cool things that our team developed here is actually a new patent pending process that actually requires additional actually hardware sensors along with firmware. So there's a combination of both to be able to actually do some pulling of actually the memory and how it's operating, and then actually allowing you to define different operating targets depending actually on the thresholds that the memory is operating at. So what you can see right here is that we have a profile of, let's say, uh, 8000 MT. So that's a very aggressive DDR5 overclock, right? It's about the fastest memory you can get openly on the market. And we have a feature that you'll see right here that's called Dim Flex. By enabling Dim Flex, you'll then actually have a, another option. Oh, sorry, right here. We uh, jumped it right there. Um, but you have another option right here that talks about dim, dim flex presets. Now these actually presets will allow you to actually dial in specific parameters that are in alignment with specific temperatures. Because actually what can happen, and many overclockers know this, that experience, or maybe you might have experienced this in, intermittently, where I tested everything and everything was stable, but then later on it wasn't stable. Part of actually that reduction in stability could have actually come from the fact that it was actually at a different temperature. And here, what you can actually have it do is that depending on the temperature, it can actually load in a different set of presets. Based on those presets, you can actually essentially target performance, 
but you can also target maximum stability. And one of the really cool things that got introduced with DDR5 was essentially a dynamic ability to have actually the memory be adjusted in real time. So this can actually be all done in the background once those parameters are dialed in to allow you to kind of maximize to the highest level of performance but in the event that the actual temperatures were to introduce a point of instability you could actually have a dialed in value that would allow it to actually uh, essentially kind of revert down to essentially a uh, maybe a looser set of timings, right? Or maybe a drop in the memory divider or whatever the corresponding delta is that you need between stability and performance. And that is a really, really cool level of functionality. Now, for many of you, you may not need to utilize this uh, in terms of kind of um, a performance tuning part for your DDR5. We are introducing this feature really to be able to provide enthusiasts more granularity to be able to achieve stability, but also for users that are really aggressively looking to be able to take advantage of the highest level of DDR5 overclocking. So if you're probably, I'd say, in the category of like 7,000 MT and below, you probably don't need to take advantage of something like DimFlex. But if you're maybe in that space of going over 7,000 MT, so you're in that, you know, 74, 76, 78, 8,000 MT or higher, the DimFlex technology could be very advantageous to you being able to essentially dial in a higher level of stability. So this is a new feature that is exclusive to the refresh motherboards. Um, while AMP2, you will actually see introduced uh, to um, other uh, essentially Z790 based motherboards uh, with a UEFI update, you will not see the DimFlex technology um, on those other motherboards because it does actually require um, essentially a hardware based revision. So do keep that in mind. Um, another difference is also going to be that the Tough Gaming motherboard has that AMP2 but it does not have that DimFlex technology. So you do also want to keep that in mind. So that is going to be another difference. So again, the ROG Strix-A, the ROG Strix-F, and the ROG Strix-E all have that DimFlex technology, okay? So that's going to be a very cool update. And again, as we get into the Maximus, all of the Maximus boards are going to have that, okay? Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the Dark Hero right now in a little bit, right? Um, Osmos is asking no ITX, no, no, uh, no new updates, but we're not we're not phasing out our Z790 I. So uh, if you're interested in a mini ITX based motherboard, check out the actually Z70 I based board, and you're going to be good to go. Okay, all right. Um, somebody asking about when will the Dash E motherboard be available? Uh, as I noted a little bit earlier, probably in about seven to 12 days. It depends on the channel partner, um, but you should expect to see it listed on our ASUS eStore, Newegg, Amazon, Micro Center, B&H, all kinds of partners in the channel will be carrying that model. Um, but I would probably expect our ASUS store and probably Newegg to be first in terms of actually carrying that, okay? All right, so that is gonna be the DimFlex technology, okay? Um, what's the motherboard? This one next to me? This one right here is our Prime Z790-A. So we're not refreshing the Prime. This one though is fully compatible just like our ProArt Creator board, which we're not also not updating, but both of those will support 14th gen series CPUs with uh, an, a UEFI BIOS update. So if you, uh, in total, we actually have our Prime series, we have our ProArt series, we have our Tough Gaming series, our ROG Strix series, our Maximus series, and we actually also have our WS series, which use C series chipsets. So actually in total, there's actually six series of socket 1700 series base motherboards, okay? All right, guys, uh, let's get ready to go into, uh, you know, for probably, for probably a lot of people out there, the stars of the show, uh, the highest end models that we've got right here is going to be, of course, our um, Maximus series motherboards. So let's get ready to show off what we got here with our Maximus series. Give me one second. I'm gonna also take a quick drink of water, but uh, let me go ahead and open this up here. Here we go. All right. All right, guys. So these are gonna be the Maximus series motherboards. Um, so if you're not aware, Maximus is our flagship series. This is where we put the most effort when it comes to kind of features, function, design, innovation, performance, kind of putting in all those little extras, right, to be able to really give you the absolute kind of premium, really amazing base boards, right? So I think you already saw that we've got a great foundation with Tough Gaming and with the RG Strict series, but if you're looking for the next level, that's what Maximus is all about, offering you a premium uh, design aesthetic, premium build quality and features and functions, uh, flagship level specification support, right? Um, and just overall kind of a holistic experience that when you talk about a flagship series based board, that's what you're gonna be getting with a Maximus series board. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look. Uh, we've got essentially three that we're gonna have here as part of this lineup. 
So we've got the ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero, the ROG Maximus Z790 Apex Encore, uh, which is going to be focused especially for those of you that are interested in overclocking, especially DDR5 overclocking, and then the ROG Maximus Z790 Formula sees its introduction as we did not have a formula for the first wave of Z790 series motherboards. So three in total. Uh, the Dark Hero is pretty much available right now with the Apex Encore and the formula coming in, and like I said, about the next uh, week to week and a half. So let's get ready to take a look at where the differences lie, because there are definitely some differences in terms of what these boards are going to be bringing to the table, okay? So first up is going to be the Maximus Dark Hero. Ugh. Got it. Hit that gym, right? Hit that gym. That is the Dark Hero box. It's such a cool looking box. <laughs> um, definitely. I know uh, for a lot of you guys, they really like that. So let's go ahead and take a look right here. So um, I'm aiming for 7800 MT. So if you're aiming definitely for 7800 MT, my recommendation is definitely probably uh, the Dashi, I think will be a, a very solid choice, but I would probably be looking at the Maximus series. The Maximus series are going to have the highest PCB layer count. They'll also have low loss PCBs, which can even be additionally beneficial to the improved signal uh, transmission performance for DDR5 overclocking. Um, of course, the Apex will be the absolute best, um, but definitely at a high target like that, do keep in mind that you also have to account for the quality of your memory controller within your CPU, okay? Um, Maximus, same term, is used for Intel and AMD? No. So for AMD, we have ROG Crosshair. That's going to be our flagship series. And then on Intel, it's ROG Maximus, okay? So it's either Crosshair for AMD or Maximus for Intel, okay? All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this guy and see what we have in the box. Uh, to do a little bit more of a tour right here, uh, I like the real rear of the box. The rear is pretty cool. It actually says Dark Hero, looks pretty slick. Pretty nice, okay? Um, Jimbo's asking a question on the screen. I'm gonna show you the screen here actually in uh, up close, but no, this screen is not like the anime matrix display. So the anime matrix display is individual LEDs that you can actually customize with uh, all types of different types of animations. You can actually even go in and create your own custom. The polymo lighting display on the Hero is actually quite a bit more advanced than the lighting display that's on the Strix boards as it's a dual layer. Uh, design so there's multiple actually designs and you can go in and you can change them there's different presets and of course you can change the colors but you can't actually customize it it's not a screen in the same way that the anime matrix is an actual screen okay so uh, of course we have this little kind of protective cover some people get confused they maximus series don't come in esd bags so don't think that there's anything wrong with that some people um wonder about that but no there's no esd bag very heavy board, but a really beautiful looking board. Now I already took the peels off of that. Um, I think it actually looks fantastic with no RGB lighting on it, which is the way that we designed the board. We designed all of our boards to look great with no RGB lighting and then with RGB lighting. Um, it's got a really premium just design aesthetic to it. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and take a closer look here. Uh, now, just some of the little items right there. I'm going to show you right here. You get your nice little sticker pack right there. It's a dual sticker pack right there. So there's actually one set right there, and there's another set on the other side. So if you're part of Team ROG, you want to be showing your ROG pride right there. you got your sticker pack. Um, as I noted right there, you get that really nice color quick start guide that also comes included with the Maximus boards. Okay. And... Just in case you're kind of wondering whether the other items that come in the in the box, I'll show you really quick here. Some people like to know what comes with the Maximus boards. So you're gonna get, uh, this is an M.2 accessory right here for when you're installing your M.2 SSDs. Same thing, M.2 SSDs. Another thermal pad for the M.2 SSDs. The Q connector, right? So for an easier connection for your front cables. Uh, of course, the Q antenna that we talked about and we demoed earlier. Uh, then you actually have a, um, this should be right here. Uh, this is going to be the actual fan holder. So there's actually a fan holder. Uh, temperatures, as we talked about with, D, uh, with a DDR5 are actually important. So this actually allows you to hold a fan to be able to get even better cooling performance for the DDR5 memory. Of course, your keychain, your SATA cables, 
uh, your, this is, I believe, the extension for the ARGB. So the extension for ARGB, M.2 pad, M.2 pad. Yeah, these are all the M.2 accessories. Yep. And then uh, your little um, card right here for registrating for RG review rewards. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and put it under the display. Give me a second to get that under there. And let's take a look at the Dark Hero. All right. <laughs> Michael's going, yeah, I'm getting a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Uh, these boards start to get quite a bit heavier. Uh, there's just, uh, of course, uh, that's another difference, of course, on the Hero. You have that really premium heat sink. Uh, excuse me, that, well, it's a heat sink, but also a backplate. You can see that huge, massive backplate. But that's really nice, too, because, of course, it just makes it nicer to hold when you're putting into a system. You don't have to worry about your fingers touching that or kind of potentially nicking or kind of getting cut open or anything like that. But also, even if you lay it down, um, it's actually okay. You can just lay it down. You don't have to worry about scuffing something. So the backplate is nice. It also can be beneficial for heavy torsion. So if you've got really, really big, dense, uh, maybe like water blocks or like a mono block or a really big, large, like, you know, dual fan cooler from Noctua or from, you know, Thermal Ride or something like that. Um, having this type of design uh, essentially just helps to reduce any type of uh, torsion. So it just makes it a little bit more rigid. Um, well, it makes it quite a bit actually more rigid. So let's go ahead and take a look here at the Dark Hero. Um, actually, well, we'll take a look first at the what's the difference before we get into taking a closer look at it, right? So let's uh, do that. So let's go here, Maximus Dark Hero. All right, so this is gonna be the Maximus uh, Dark Hero. And then uh, pricing, actually, let me go ahead and uh, put in the pricing as well. So Maximus, I believe, should be $699.99. All right, here we go. So this is going to be the Maximus Z790. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. Teasing you guys, teasing you guys, giving you the, the, the apex. All right, here we go. Dark Hero. All right, so there you guys go. So Maximus Z790 Dark Hero is going to be coming in at $699. Here we can actually compare the difference between the current Maximus Z790 Hero and then the Z790 Dark Hero. So what's going to be new? Uh, there's going to be a little bit of an aesthetic upgrade. Um, I will actually say the poly mode design is actually even a little bit more vibrant, um, but we'll show you that actually when we take a closer look at the board kind of up close on the secondary cam. Um, the biggest change, though, is going to be a very big change in terms of the PCIe slot layout and, and the overall M.2 SSE support. With this generation, you didn't have native PCI Express M M.2.5 support, so the board supported actually up to five drives, but you had to use the Hyper M.2 adding card. Now, I actually really like that design because um, we do see a high number of users Users, and I would love to know what you guys actually do. We see a high number of Maximus Hero users that do water-cooled builds. So when you have a water-cooled build, you can actually have a single slot card. And so having that Hyper M.2 add-in card was kind of nice because you could just add in the M.2 SSDs, slot that in there. And that's also a big difference with the Hero compared to the other boards is you have dual PCI Express Gen 5 slots. So you could actually put your GPU here or you could put your GPU here and effectively you could run it by eight. As I noted, that's not gonna be a reduction in terms of performance, but it gives you more of a visual spacing. So if maybe you wanted to show this off more and have your GPU there, you could do that. Or maybe if you want to have this and you want to have a an expansion card, right, that requires a high level of bandwidth, you can also do that actually on the Hero. Um, but this board has been redesigned to be able to actually have five M.2 SSDs natively on the motherboard, so no hyper M.2 adding card required, and that slot as well is also going to be PCI Express Gen 5. So again, remember, we start off PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD support starting from the Dash E. So the Tough Gaming board, the Dash A, and the Dash F do not have PCI Express Gen 5, even though the Dash A and the Dash F both support up to five M.2 SSDs. So here you get five, just like the Dash E, and it also gives you PCI Express Gen 5 support. You have that really cool dim flex feature that we just talked about, Wi-Fi 7 with that Q antenna, which is that new, really easy uh, way to be able to go ahead and install your uh, antenna. The QLED with the dim, dim tech, uh, excuse me, dim detect technology that we demoed earlier. Um, now SATA port does take a, a reduction. So the prior board actually had six, 
This board only has four. Part of that comes from actually the configurable PCH. And we're here, we're, since we have more M.2, you're seeing actually a reduction there. So it is four SATA versus six SATA. It also has that AMP2 technology. It has the reinforced uh, USB 3 internal header, but also the Hero, like we talked about earlier, for somebody asked about it, this has dual USB 3 headers. So USB-C, and it also has right here, uh, internal USB 3 and internal USB 3. And also keep in mind that all the Maximus boards have the quick charging support. So just like what we did previously, this auxiliary power header here is not for overclocking. That is specifically for 60 watt power charging support. So if you want your front USB-C port to be able to provide up to 60 watts of power, then you have to connect that PCI Express power connector and it can give you up to 60 watts of fast charging support. It also will come with the new Intel Unisum software, which you guys, if you don't know about it, it's a really cool software suite that actually allows you to essentially have full kind of real-time access to your mobile device, whether it's Android or iOS. So you can actually do text, notification, easy drag and drop. Um, it's a really robust, really cool piece of software and it will come included. Again, ROG Maximus boards always give you a huge amount in this regard. They come with a full one-year licensed version of ESIET, uh, AV security software. You're gonna also get a full licensed version of ADA64, which comes included with the board. Memtest is built into the UEFI BIOS, right? You get that Intel uh, software that also comes included. So there's a lot of extra value that's not just in the hardware design. There's so many other cool things that come with the Maximus boards. But um, let's go ahead and now take a closer look here at the Maximus board. Uh, let's put our lighting on here. And right there, you can see actually just how cool that new uh, Polymo display is on here. So it's even a little bit brighter. I'll darken that up just so you can kind of see in there. But it's got a really cool design right there. It almost creates like a little bit of a uh, kind of a depth effect that you have there that's pretty slick. It's really nice. And of course, when you go into the RGB software within Armory Crate, you can customize the lighting and you do have different kind of patterns, different preset control that you have available to you. This is just the default animation that's on the board. Um, again, and if you turn it off, which if you're kind of team dark, team no RGB, team stealth, um, it still looks fantastic because it has that like chrome appearance, which I think looks really, really, really nice. Now here you're going to see a huge, massive VRM heatsink. The power delivery is going to be the best on the Maxima series boards, where of course we have even higher performing power stages, a higher number of power stages. This is a full heat pipe assembly that goes from here into here. This is all uh, a heatsink, although on the Power Dash E, it's also an extended heatsink design, but just massive heatsink assembly, uh, higher grade capacitors, micro fine alloy inductors, so again, the power delivery on here is outstanding. Higher PCB layer count with also a low loss PCB design that you're also gonna have on this board. Some of the other things that you may or may not notice is that we do grouped power connectors. This is gonna be more advantageous for enthusiasts and water coolers. Instead of having kind of multiple fan headers split on multiple parts of the board, we kind of group them all together in quadrants to allow for kind of more streamlined cable management, right? Um, you're gonna have, of course, your start, your flex key, which you can map to different functions right there. Uh, you're also gonna see right there that you're gonna have the retry button, which is gonna be uh, a new introduction there as well. As we scroll down there, a very large, very dense um, M.2 uh, SSD heatsink right here. Now, if you guys remember when I showed off on the other boards, right, that the M.2 SSD heatsinks on the other ones, you had one dual contact design. If we take a look here at the Dark Hero, one, you're gonna see that massive heatsink. So it's a huge heatsink. But if we take a look here, for this board, you'll also see that we have now have more, we have multiple M.2 dual contact slots, okay? And I'll pop in the chat and the questions right there. So here you can see that you've got one, two, three, four, five, and three of those are gonna be dual contact. So compared to the other board where you have one dual contact, you've got one, two, three dual contact. So that's gonna be another upgrade. You've got, it's got the quick release design. You have, of course, that 60 watt charging, that's 20 gigabits, the USB three there. You're also gonna have your USB three uh, connector here excuse me, uh, your secondary USB 3 all the way down here. Uh, you got your water flow headers. So this is gonna be for inlet and for outlet, right? Uh, as well as for water flow monitoring, that's the water cooling zone header. That's not gonna be something on the RG Strict series. 
You'll also still have that PCI alteration mode switch that we talked about, the dual PCI Express Gen 5 slots that are on this board, and then the Supreme FX audio design. Keep in mind that this board does have an ESS Saber DAC and amp built on board, so the audio is higher grade than the audio that you get on the ROG Strix boards, which is still Supreme FX. Uh, it's very nice. It has the Realtek uh, 4080 uh, uh, audio codec along with a savvy tech amp but this is going to have that 4080 in conjunction with an ess saber dac and amp on board so it's going to be higher grade um, i really love this really clean design here on this uh, heat sink assembly that we have here for the dark hero okay and then in terms of the rear io i will show you the rear io but that gives you just a look right there at the dark hero looking really really nice looking very premium. Uh, let's go ahead and take a closer look here at the IO and we'll also go ahead and uh, take a look and see if we have questions right here. So give me a second to bring up the chat, bring up any questions on the Dark Hero. And uh, where's my images here? There we go. All right, so here's our images for our Dark Hero. The back plate, as we noted, and here you're going to see for the I.O., the big upgrade you're going to get here, right? So you got uh, four USB. Those are all high speed, five gigabits, 10 gigabit, 10 gigabit. But then here, this board has Thunderbolt 4, USB 4, right? So you're going to have essentially 40 gigabit space throughput. So ultra high speed. So if you wanted the fastest based I.O., then this is going to be the board for you. The other boards, remember, you have to buy the Thunderbolt 4 adding card if you want Thunderbolt connectivity. Then you have USB-C. So you've got three rear USB-C on this board. Uh, then you can also see your remainder of your Type-A ports. So that's going to be four, that's going to be eight, that's going to be 10, that's going to be 12. 12 ports, HDMI, clear CMOS, USB BOSS, flashback, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, Wi-Fi 7 with the Q antenna design, and then multi-channel audio out with the optical out. Okay, so that is going to cover all of those right there. Um, so let's go ahead and quickly see um, if we have any uh, questions that might come up right there. So give me one second here. And I uh, will check in the chat here. So let me see. Um, the Strix has 20 gigabit USB on the rear. Yes, that is correct. The, the uh, RG Strix does have 20 gigabits, but remember that the R, the, uh, the the Hero does also have 20 gigabits internally, and then it has 40 gigabits right on the rear. So remember the Dash E doesn't have 40 gigabits, right? But if you really wanted 20 gigabits, I guess, on the rear, as opposed to that Thunderbolt USB 4, then that's a differential between the two. So that is correct. Um, uh, does that uh, do the Thunderbolt supports uh, does excuse me do the ports support Thunderbolt 2 devices generally yes they should be interoperable but the connector standard can vary in terms of the protocol support for the host controller to the device I would always recommend checking with the client manufacturer see if they have specific uh, testing interoperability reports between testing with Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4 do they recommend certain drivers do they recommend certain firmware updates there are kind of some things that you sometimes have to check into in terms of verifying on that okay why does the Hero have two CPU? Pretty much all of the actual motherboards have two CPU power connectors. So even actually the Tough Gaming motherboard has two CPU power connectors. So if we actually go over here, I think what they're asking me about right here is this guy right here, right? Why is there two? Um, that is just actually for load distribution. So actually the pins that we have here, if you'll notice these pins are very thick. So for years, uh, we actually have now been using what we call our ProCool power connectors. These pins are actually thicker than standard pins, so they actually have better uh, transmission of efficacy and efficiency, um, and they also have a higher current handling. So actually, one, one of these is already higher performing than a standard one, but two of them actually allow for just better actually current distribution and current handling. It also will reduce tension, uh, temperature um, at the contact for each one of them, but all of the boards actually have this. So the Tough Gaming board actually has dual um, CPU power connectors. The Strix board has, this has dual. The Maximus board has dual. So um, you're fine if you want to just connect one, but of course, if your power supply has dual, then you would want to connect both, okay? Um, 
Somebody asking about glacial. We have no plans to reflesh the glacial. There's no extreme board either. So if you wanted to do like a very high end water cooling, recommendation would be to consider getting like a mono block from one of our partners. So from, you know, EK or from Bits Power, or from different partners that have produced a mono block, you can get really great, nice, high quality mono blocks that will cover the VRM assembly and will also cover the CPU. Uh, so you can have a really nice clean design. Um, let me just see if there's any other quick questions. Uh, doesn't look like it. Um, no, yes, there's no RGB on the PCH. So correct. So if we go back right here, so on the Dark Hero, we will come down. This, there's no lighting. This is all just like a stealth, really clean design right here. So it has a little bit of kind of like uh, some kind of reflectivity to it, right? Where it can kind of seem a little bit brighter, a little bit darker, a little bit more stealth. But yes, there's no uh, there's no RGB lighting. The only RGB lighting is just in the polymo section right here, okay? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, go into some other elements right here. So give me one second. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and here just bring up the page to quickly touch on some cool things on the hero just to give a little bit further context uh, for understanding what are going to be kind of some of the differences between um, that say the ROG Strix series and the Maximus series. So these things aren't going to be new. They also exist on the current hero, but sometimes people aren't necessarily always aware that these items are going to be, let's say, different or going to be present. So let me go ahead and just um, bring this up a little bit here and I'll kind of just show you guys some of the differences right here. So give me one second. Uh, bring up some little footage right there. I will bring up our dark hero. Uh, page and that way I can go ahead and just talk about some of the items that are going to kind of be on this board so so if we bring up the product page here's the product page for the dark hero all the links are in the chat um, uh, excuse me for that so um, AIOC again is on all the motherboards so that's not a differentiation point Wi-Fi 7 is on everything except for the tough gaming board all the boards have AMP2 talked about the dash e also has pci express gen 5 support ai cooling is all the way down to the tough gaming motherboard thunderbolt is going to be specific to the maximus ports of the dark hero the polymo lighting will be specific the highest grade power delivery will also be specific as well we talked about things like the dual front usb 3 is also going to be specific to the maximus hero board the water cooling zone headers is specific to the maximus board the ESS Sabre DAC and AMP, which is on the Supreme FX audio design, is also exclusive to the Maximus series motherboard. The higher grade PCB, so it's a higher PCB layer count. Uh, it also has a low loss PCB. It's also going to be specific to the Maximus series motherboard. Um, now, one of the other cool things for overclockers is going to be something that is called differential die sense voltage monitoring. This is a more advanced form that requires actually a hardware design to allow for actually a more accurate voltage readout. So actually our Maximus series will give you the most accurate readouts in software. Um, in a non-differential die sense voltage monitoring, you still get readouts, but you will not actually necessarily get the most accurate readout. Now, ideally, you would still, the most accurate form will be directly through a, a contact or actually even potentially even more advanced than a multimeter pro, but actually be utilizing an oscilloscope. But most people don't have access to that. Most people don't want to go through the complexity of that. So this is essentially kind of a bridge between to, again, give more accuracy. And this just allows you to be um, also more efficient with the voltages that you're supplying. With the more accurate readout, you can actually be more tailored to actually giving less voltage when you need or more voltage when you need it because of the actual more accurate readout. This is exclusive to the Maximus series boards and actually um, really across the industry, very I don't know actually any other boards that openly actually do differential die sense voltage monitoring. And it's been a hallmark for Maximus boards for years. So again, this is another differential outside of just like the power delivery design uh, where we talk about things like, you know, the high quality components that we have on there, whether the power stages, whether they're the inductors, whether it's the capacitors, the PCB design, that is going to be a specific, specific difference. Um, now, you also are going to have actually a more advanced power delivery design for the actual DRAM as well. That can be beneficial at actually also running higher speed memory with sustained loads. Uh, we talked about, of course, the higher performance VRM heatsink assembly, right, with, of course, the multi-stage heat, uh, heat, heat pipe design that is also present on the board as well, okay? And then, of course, uh, for the M.2 SSD heatsinks, we talked about how this board has three M.2 dual contact heatsinks, right? So essentially, you can have three of those dual contact designs 
whereas on the other motherboards you're only going to be getting one right um, so those are going to be uh, the vast majority of kind of design differences here just i retouched it on i touched on it earlier but uh, this is actually the software suite that I was talking about where we have now integration to let you know more information on the directionality and essentially positioning information for your Wi-Fi. So you can actually help to know, hey, do you need to actually rotate it? Do you need to actually make an adjustment so that you can get better performance? So all that is baked in now as part of kind of the Q antenna and the Wi-Fi experience. So some really, really nice items there. Okay. Um, don't need to worry really touch on any of those parts. Um, this board does also continue to come with our AI networking technology, which is essentially our game first packet priority suite. This has now also been fully integrated into AC as opposed to being a separated piece. So if you do want more robust control for kind of uh, packet prioritization, then you do also have that available to you on this board. And keep in mind that the ADA64 license that is a full licensed version that comes included. So that's great for um, stress testing your system, for doing performance checks, all that stuff that comes included with the board. So that is going to be the Maximus Z6, Z790 Dark Hero. We're now going to get ready to actually talk about the Apex board. But uh, let me go ahead and check, see if there's going to be any other quick questions that's there. Um, is there enough space? Yes, you have no problems doing a Ryujin. So, so somebody asking, can you you can do a Ryujin uh, 360? Yes, um, it doesn't matter whether you use Ryujin 2 or Ryujin 3. The actual housing spacing is exactly the same, but there's no issues. You can run a Ryu or a Ryujin on here. So our flagship coolers will entirely fit with no problems. Um, Yeah, so uh, WRXD, yes, I did explain uh, AMPA2, so, um, but we'll actually have a full demo of AMP2, but to recap essentially kind of what you're getting with AMP2 is we have a more advanced actually implementation. Um, if we have a little bit of time at the end, I don't know, we're, we're kind of getting a little bit over and I wanna wrap up on the apex and the formula, but essentially what AMP2 is gonna give you the ability is that if you take essentially DIMMs, that are not essentially XMP profiled. This is gonna be for kits that are like a default SPD of 4800 uh, or 52 or 5600 MT. Um, we will actually automatically actually analyze that and then make an adjustment to be able to actually provide you a higher level of essentially DRAM uh, clocking performance. So like this kit right here, this is a 5600 kit and with AMP2, I can run this at 7000. Um, I think this is most advantageous generally for people that might be buying like the tough gaming motherboard because the tough gaming motherboard is a lower price point. So if I don't necessarily wanna buy really expensive, maybe DDR5 memory, and I wanna buy maybe more kind of cost aggressive DDR5 memory, I could buy like a 5600, but then maybe get like up to 6800 or 7000 MT out of that kit without having to buy like a 7000 kit of memory. But that's what AMP2 is. Essentially think about it like an auxiliary to XMP. Most people will buy a module that is probably going to be an XMP kit of memory, right? So we'll have an XMP profile, so it's already designed to be overclocked. But the AMP is specifically for non-XMP profiled kits, okay? Um, Dark Hero has, yes, that's correct. The Dark Hero has five M.2 SSD slots on the motherboard, right? Where the actual prior motherboard actually only had three. And on top of that, it has native, native PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD support, right? So if we go back to our recap slide, let me just go back here before we go to the, uh, to the formula. Um, we can just show here again, what is the difference, right? What is the upgrades that we get if you're considering this Right now, for most people, I don't think you need to upgrade. Right, if you already have a, a Z690 or Z790 Hero, those are great boards. Unless you really need a specific feature or function, there it's a great option. And again, you could also be considering maybe like a Dash E or the Dash F if you wanted Wi-Fi 7. Right, um, but if we take a look at the upgrades, um, let's remove the aesthetic upgrade. Right, because that's fairly similar, but there is a bit of a change. But it's five M.2 slots versus three with Gen 5 support where the prior board did not have five slots on board and you didn't have native Gen 5. You had Gen 5, but you had to use the Hyper M.2 adding card. You have the new DimFlex technology, which remember that is a hardware-based feature that it has to be implemented. Wi-Fi 7 with that Q antenna design. 
You also have the new QLED with the dim detect feature. Um, then AMP2, but AMP2 actually we should be rolling out to other Z790 motherboards, uh, even prior boards with the UEFI update, the reinforced USB 3.2 header, and then the Intel software, uh, which also comes bundled in. So those are going to be your differences, uh, excuse me, differentiating differentiation points between the prior hero and the new hero. So let's get ready to go now into uh, the next board, which is going to be the formula. Okay, so let me go ahead and bring up our pricing here for the, um, well, I guess we'll do the Apex because technically the Apex is less than the formula. So I guess we'll go with the uh, Apex first. So um, we'll do this. Okay. All right, so tell me, are you in the are you in the group? Are you excited about the Apex? Are you Team Apex? Let's go ahead and take a look right here. So the next one we're going to talk about here is going to be the ROG Maximus Apex Encore. Okay, so this is going to be an update compared to the prior on uh, prior Apex, which we had, which was of course in white, and this one will now be in black. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and bring up the image first, and then I will go ahead and take out the board. So give me one second here to bring up the Apex. All right, so here we go. Apex Encore is gonna be coming in at 649. Okay, so what do we have in terms of the features or the specification differences between the prior Apex, right? Uh, but again, this is also gonna be, you know, you could be coming from other boards. So keep in mind that the, some of these differences will apply too, right? Um, if you're not aware, the reason why this board only has two DIMM slots is specifically because of course, two DIMM boards in terms of this topology, it has superior, effect, uh, excuse me, superior signal uh, handling. There's actually what's called lower signal reflection. Um, so if you're really interested in very, very high DDR5 overclocking, so 7,800 MT, 8000 MT, 8200 MT, 8400 MT higher, this is going to be the board that you're really going to want to focus in on because you have an increased probability in terms of success rate at higher overclocking, even with the same CPU. If you took the same CPU from a hero and then you ran that same CPU on the Apex, you would get higher DRM overclocking because of the two DIM topology as opposed to the four DIM topology. So that's an important differential point. Um, now, in terms of the specification upgrade, this board is also going to now be five M.2 SSDs. So it will have three on the board and then it has the DIM.2 adding card. Uh, we'll talk about the DIM.2 adding card for those of you who don't know about it. But you now have also PCI Express Gen 5 natively on the motherboard, not via the DIM.2. DIM.2 is still limited to PCI Express Gen 4, but it does have Gen 5 natively on the motherboard. You have the DIM Flex technology that we talked about, Wi-Fi 7 with the Q antenna, the QLED with the DIM detect. A revised PCI slot layout, right? Um, which I also think is advantageous right here. I'll show you actually one of the advantages right here. But one of the main things you'll notice right here is that if you put in something like a 4090, this slot is still accessible, where in this configuration, only the bottom slot would have maintained availability. But here you could actually put a graphics card and then still have that slot and still have this slot available. So it actually allows for more flexibility uh, with this slot layout configuration. So that is actually going to be, I'd say, a notable benefit as well. Um, it is a reduction in terms of the SATA ports, right? This is going to be four versus six. But again, here you have more M.2 SSDs, AMP2, the reinforced USB 3.2 uh, header, uh, and then you also have the Intel software suite. So those are going to be all of the relative updates for the Apex. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a closer look at the Apex. We're going to talk about some other elements specific to the Apex. So give me one second here. Um, and I will go ahead and get my Apex board out right here. So give me one sec. All right. Uh, so let me put, let me actually put the hero away really quick. You guys can take a look at some of that beautiful B-roll with that Apex. And tell me, what do you guys, do you guys, uh, like the change it was always a big debate right where we had some people that loved uh the black and then some people that wanted the white of course now for white we will have the formula so we took the apex back to black right um i actually like that oh that's a big box All right. All 
All right, so here we guys, here we go. This is the Apex Encore. So here we got the Apex Encore. All right, let's go ahead and take a closer look at it right here. Um, so this is going to be right here, the Apex Encore box. All right, I'll show you guys the back there. A little bit, just you got a picture of the board, you know, the Q antenna, power delivery. This is gonna be one of the cool new things on the fan that we're gonna talk about, the, uh, the two dim topology design, so. Okay. All right, so let's take out that. And then I'm gonna also take out the the dim dot two and then the fan bracket because there's a new fan accessory here which um, is really going to be focused for I think the overclockers out there for guys that want to be able to put together a system and focus on their DDR5 overclocking okay so we will show these two off here in a second but we're going to take a look at some of the closer images and then we'll take a closer look physically at the board right here but let's go ahead and uh, take a look here at the closer images for the Apex. All right, so here we go. This is going to be for the Apex Encore. And you'll see uh, it's got that revised ID design, just a little bit of soft lighting right there in terms of, of course, that large VRM heatsink assembly, right? Uh, two dim topology, there's that dim.2 adding card, right? The dual power connectors. There's some revisions on the fan connectors as well. I'll talk about that a little bit. The slot layout has gone ahead and also changed here. Now you'll see right here that there's an item in this picture and then in this picture <laughs> changes. And then what you actually have right here, this is actually gonna be the fan bracket. So that fan bracket then can provide direct airflow for, uh, of course, your dims. It can also actually provide some airflow there to the dim.2, right? So that can also provide a benefit to, of course, high-performing uh, uh, M.2 based SSDs. Uh, there you can see a better example there of actually the fan bracket as actually is attached and right there. And this will actually support up to a 60 centimeter based fan. So it's uh, quite nice there. And this also does have full integration in terms of the fan control software. So you still have full flexibility in terms of being able to go ahead and control the fan curve for that. Okay. And there you can see the inclusion. There's the actual uh, Q antenna, right? The extra thermal pad, the M.2, M.2 accessories, and then the actual fan bracket right there. Now you don't see the actual DIM.2 adapter, but the DIM.2 adapter also comes included with there, right? Um, so let's go ahead and uh, show you guys right here how, like some of the, the key elements as we take a look here at the Apex. So let me go ahead and connect it right here. And there we go. Uh, all right. All right, so here we go. It's the Apex Encore. So there you can see. Now nah, it's got, let me go ahead and remove that. You can see just that nice kind of, I really love this design here on the Apex where it's got this little bit of the underglow that's right underneath the VRM heatsink. I, like, I love the way that that looks. Of course, the dual power connectors. Keep in mind that for the fan headers on the Apex, if you see them in white right here, they also say FS. That means it's a full speed fan. Um, of course, SMD capacitors right there, low profile. That's going to really be for the overclockers, but it does give us very nice performance as well. Ultra high performance power delivery design on here. Um, really flagship level. Do keep in mind, though, that the way that the power delivery is spec'd in here, there's no actually power delivery for the iGPU. So uh, that's the reason why this board actually does not have integrated graphics out like the Hero or the Formula. So keep in mind, this is really purpose built for somebody that's always going to be using a discrete based graphics card. Okay. Uh, here's the DIM.2 add-in card. So if you've never seen the dim.2 adding card that's what this guy is i think this is actually not only this is really nice for those that are actually going to do water cooled builds because one of the great things if you do a water cooled build uh, with this is that if you have a full loop and everything is up and running in your loop you can use the dim.2 adding card and you can add two m.2 ssds and you can literally just uh install it like you were installing memory onto your system, right? And you don't have to drain your loop, you don't have to replumb it, you don't have to do anything, right? Where normally, of course, if you install your M.2 SSDs, 
probably you're going to have one primary which gets installed here, right? So you can always have access to that. But on some of the other boards, that's where, like I was talking about, that actually, like on the Tough Gaming or the RG Strix models, because of their slot layout positioning, they actually give you sometimes flexibility, which can be nice because you can still access certain slots. But here, some of the other slots are going to be restricted, especially if you have your GPU installed. But if you notice here, even if you have something that's obstructing access to there, that's the great thing about the Dim.2 SSD design, right? Is that literally I can just remove that install my two uh two up to two m.2 ssds pci express gen 4 and they slot directly into that so that's a really great innovation that we of course have now had for years of course you have all your oc centric level controls that are going to be on there um, which i'm not going to dive into those because those are all a very niche based controls uh, i will touch on some of the things that i do think a lot of enthusiasts can still benefit from of course you still have your standard start button you have your flex key which you can remap to different items you got your uh, 20 gigabits USB right there. You got, the, of course, the PCI Express uh, release mechanism, right, with our Q release uh, design. You have, of course, an internal USB 3 header right there. Um, as you scroll down, you move a little bit further, you got your water cooling zone headers that are going to be also on here. Now, this board, it does actually have a dual BIOS design. The cool, the cool thing about having a dual BIOS design is there's actually two independent ROMs. So if you want to be able to have one ROM with one version and then another ROM with another version, you can actually do that. So if you want to run like a specific overclock parameter under one ROM and test it, and then you want to have maybe a full stock parameter, you can do that and you can actually toggle between the two BIOSes. Pretty much all the other motherboards are going to have just one single ROM, so they have just one BIOS. But this motherboard actually has two BIOS chips on board, so you can actually have two independent different versions. I really love having that, especially just as a performance tuner, as an overclocker, I love having the dual BIOS design. Um, you also then have another USB 3 header that's going to be in here. So this board, even though it's an XOC-centric board, you can still see that you have two front USB 3 headers. This is great for higher-end chassis. You have the PCI alteration mode switch, which is also on this board right and as i noted up to five m.2 ssds here this one also has the dual pci express gen 5 slots that are going to be on here supreme effects audio design on this board is still high grade audio design but it is not like the hero the hero has a higher grade design where it has the um ess saber dac and amp where this board does not have the es saber dac and amp okay um so if you're wondering what it looks like if you install a large dpu here we can put on a 4090 and you can still see right here that with the Apex, you could actually still have the actual fan bracket adapter. You still have actually access right here to this top slot, which is this is a redesign compared to the prior generation. So you have right here, you can see there's uh, M.2 SSD, M.2 SSD. This one's PCI Express Gen 5. You have an open by four right there that you have access to. Um, you have the ability that you can put in your, your adapter. And then at the bottom, you can still see you have another open slot that is available to you for expansion along with all your other headers. So this new slot design, I think even allows for more flexibility for uh, kind of for builders or for enthusiasts. They want more flexibility for maybe adding something like a, a capture card or maybe like a, I like doing all my builds. A lot of people don't um, really think about it, but I like using U.2 and U.3 versus M.2 because I can go with much higher capacities. Um, you know, you can get a U.2, U.3 drive up to uh, over 30 terabytes as opposed to having to stack multiple M.2 SSDs. Um, but that is just something uh, that I like. So having an open PCI Express slot that I have available to me, actually, I'm a big fan of. So that is going to be the kind of the slot layout redesign there that you see on the Apex. And then um, here, I'll just show you the little module right here. So give me one second to bring this up. Let me see right here. Uh, any questions that came up right here? Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I have to move over there into the comments feed. Okay, any plans? Um, is the DAC worth it? So uh, that's a really great question. The way that I think about the DAC, right, is it depends on your headset. So like here, this is one of our, uh, I really love this headphone. It's one of the, it's my favorite headphone that we've made in our lineup. And it's actually very good compared to a lot of headphones is the RG Delta. Now this Delta already comes with the, an actual ESS Sabre DAC built into it. And a large number of USB headsets actually have their own DAC built into them. And, and they might not be as good as a DAC that you're gonna have like on this Delta. But the point is, is that if you have a digital headset, the analog audio design doesn't matter right? 
Um, so the analog audio design only matters if you're going to be using an analog headset. So that means it has actually a 3.5 millimeter jack. That's where it can provide value. Now, if you have an outboard DAC and amp or a discrete sound card, those will still be generally higher performing, but the audio quality on that DAC is quite good. Um, it provides solid punch. It gives you a better sound stage, better tonality. So I'd say if you haven't made the investment in a discrete audio device, use it see if you're happy with it or if you want to upgrade but it is better than standard audio but it is not going to be as high end as like a, an outboard extreme you know um you know external dac solution or something along those lines right so you can still get much higher quality audio externally or through an add-in card okay um Uh, is the extra fan cooling the RAM or the SSD? So it does, it hits both. So here I'm gonna show you kind of again, this little bracket here. So here you guys can see it's, a, it's actually a larger than a standard actually a fan. So a lot of times the fan assists were usually like a 40 centimeter. This is actually a 60 centimeter based fan. So it's actually a larger fan. And if you actually take a look right here, You'll see there, there's kind of the fan, and here's the dim dot two, and here's the memory. So the fan actually is directly providing airflow to both the dim dot two and also to the DRAM. So you would actually be able to benefit in terms of providing airflow to both of those devices. So essentially your DRAM, as well as your uh, M.2 SSDs that would be installed onto the DIM.2 adding cards. Now keep in mind that the DIM.2 adding card does have a heat sink. So this is a heat sink and this is a heat sink and there's thermal pads. Plus you also might have like intake airflow that's coming from your top of your chassis. We generally find that the thermal performance is very good on this because you've also isolated it away from other hotter spots that are generally on the motherboard. So generally the uh, thermal performance is already quite good there. Okay. Um, are there any plans on the Dark Hero? Um, right now we have no plans to refresh any of our AM5 motherboards. They're really great options, but we don't have any plans um, to do that. Um, let me just see right there, any good questions? Um, looks like... So some people are asking about the design. Yeah, let me go ahead and show you again the design. I really like the way the design looks, but you know, this is where you can get your guys' feedback. So here, you can see right there, there's the ROGI. So it's got a little bit of a dual tone texture. Now, part of it is always gonna be cut off when you have a bit of a GPU, right? It depends, of course, on the GPU that you're positioning there. Um, it looks really good if you have a single slot card, right? So if you got like a water-cooled card, you'll see the majority of the ROGI, but essentially there's some multiple textures and tones in here, right? So you can see right here, there's the ROGI and then there's the ROGI. So it's a dual tone texture. It gives it just a little bit of contrast, which I think looks quite nice, right? Between right here, uh, this black, and then you kind of move in here, right, where you have actually this uh, outline, right, to the black, right, which is actually cementing the ROGI. So let me actually show you right here what it would look like if I put on the GPU. Uh, here's a smaller GPU, right? You can see kind of what it looks like. You just see a little bit of some of the accent lines, and that's the reality, of course, always. If you went vertical, it'd even be more, right? You're going to kind of block up everything. And if I were to show off a bigger graphics card, if we go back to the 4090, you'll see how much it covers it there, which pretty much it's gonna cover the entirety of it, right? So you'll see that the design is no longer even relevant, right? It's pretty much all covered, right? But you still get these nice little accents right here, of course, in terms of the apex and some little nice kind of, uh, uh, some of the design elements that you have there on that secondary M.2 heatsink. Okay, all right, so hopefully that answers that question right there. Um, let me just quickly see if there was any other quick questions that might've came up right there. Um, is the bottom PCI slot, so yes, the bottom PCI slot, that is just like the, the hero. So that's one of the kind of the value points specifically when you talk about like the Maximus series is that you get the dual gen five. So if I go back here and let me just go ahead and bring up uh, the apex image right here. Um, this slot right here is a physical by 16 or by eight. And then this can also be a by eight. So you can essentially run a full GPU in there. So if you wanted to run like a single slot GPU, you could pick the top slot or you could pick the bottom slot. Even with a 4090, um, the performance is the same. So it doesn't matter. So yes, that is a full kind of performance GPU slot that you have available to you. You can go with either that top slot or you can go with that bottom slot, okay?
Um, so somebody asking about is going to be a bigger supply for the Apex. So the Apex is always produced generally as what we call a limited production board. So um, I would say that, that we are we know that there's definitely was a lot of demand for the Apex. So I would say that there's going to be a healthy level of inventory. But as always, if you are interested in getting a board like the Apex, then we strongly recommend you get it because um, uh, Actually, all of the Maximus boards, with the exception of the Hero, are considered actually a limited production. So our Extreme board is considered a limited production. The uh, the Apex is considered a limited production. Okay, and uh, the Hero though is always considered kind of long-term production board. So let me go ahead and get ready to pull out here the formula, and we'll get ready to kind of wrap things out. So uh, let me go ahead and just put this away here. All right. And again, if, if I missed any questions, feel free to go ahead and just ask. I'll do my best to go ahead and cover those questions when I can. And uh, also, I uh, just want to plug there, we're going to have that secondary live stream that will be a full performance live stream where I'll do just like what we did with our prior generation. We will be doing overclocking um, in that live stream. So we'll do a full demo of our Asus AIOC. We'll demo AMP technology. Uh, we'll look at a lot of really cool things. Um, to be able to give you guys insight in terms of that we'll actually talk about also uh, um, expectations in terms of frequency and a lot of really good stuff that we've actually covered in our prior 12th and 13th gen series live streams when talking about the chipset and kind of what you want to keep in mind when you talk about performance tuning and things along those lines okay um can I use a Gen 5 M.2 SSC slot with a Gen 4 SSC? Yes, 100%. So the Gen 5 slots on the motherboard are fully backwards compatible with Gen 4. So yeah, you don't have to run a Gen 5 M.2 SSD. You can run a Gen 4. Um, so you're entirely fine in that respect. They're fully backwards compatible. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look here at our last board. It's going to be the formula. Oh my gosh, that's, that's even heavier. That, that board's even heavier. <laughs> All right. So here we guys go. We're going to wrap it up here with the formula. So let's go ahead and get into it. This is going to be uh, 749 So let me go ahead and update our, uh, our pricing uh, points right here. So give me one second. All right, so the Maximus Z790 formula. Um, again, this is pretty exciting because of course we haven't had, we didn't have a formula previously for Z790. The last formula we had was Z690. And there's actually quite a number of changes for this formula. So um, if you're excited about this board, there's actually a lot of stuff that's actually changed here. So let's go ahead and take a look at it here. We're gonna take, the, take it out of the box. We're gonna talk about all the different upgrades, all the different changes. Like always though, we're just gonna also go ahead and bring up our initial kind of what's the difference here. Um, and I'll, I will take this one out of the box. So give me one second while I take this one out of the box. Let me, uh, I think I got some nice B-roll here I can share with you guys. So let me go ahead and do that while I take this out of the box. So give me one second. And I think I got some right here for the formula. Oh yeah, let's, there, there we go, there we go. Let's take a look at the, some of that while I take that out of the box, all right. Oh yeah, it's quite a bit heavier. Okay. All right. And this one, like the other, I don't think I need to take out the accessories. Pretty much shows you guys all the prior accessories that you need to be aware of, so I'm not gonna take those out. Okay, all right, and let me position my board here. Oh, there's gonna be a lot of peels here. <laughs> all right, we're gonna have a lot of peels right here. All right, so uh, let's first, uh, let me actually answer this question. I think this is a really quick question. The formula has always been water cooling focus. And actually, I'm gonna actually say no. Um, we expect the board to be able to complement water cooling, but it's not inherently only water cooling. Um, so for years, the design for the VR sheet for the VRM heat sink and water block, which is actually this portion right here, was always been what's called a hybrid design. That means it can run entirely passive and actually most formula users do not water cool 
the actual VRM. They buy the board because they love the shroud design and then they maybe want other spec that the formula brings. So from a spec standpoint, the spec is still gonna even still be higher than the hero. So you still get other upgrades. So whether you're buying it because it might be white, whether it's because it has the OLED live glass display, whether it's because it has 5G networking on it compared to just 2.5G networking, it's not just that it's water cooling. Um, you know, actually, we probably see the highest level of water cooling uses amongst the hero, where uh, users will they'll just use a traditional CPU block, or they'll also use maybe something like a mono block, which a mono block will cover both the VRM and it will also cover the CPU. Um, but in terms, do we design it to complement water cooling enthusiasts? Yes. So if you are going to do water cooling, you can. But again, you could just be water cooling the CPU and the GPU, but you do not need to water cool the VRM. You can run it entirely passive just as it is, and it will be entirely fine. The quality of the components and the internal heatsink itself is actually very, very effective at still providing you very good thermal performance. So it's not a water cooling requirement. Um, but does it complement water cooling enthusiasts? Yes. Okay. So we're going to talk about the differences here. Let's go ahead and jump into what is going to be different between this and actually the last version, which was the Z690 version. Okay. All right. So taking a look at the versions, excuse me, the two boards right here, uh, we can see we have the RG Maximus Z690 formula and then the RG Maximus Z790 formula. So first off, of course, you can tell just the aesthetic styling difference. Uh, they're both, of course, largely white and silver. They look fantastic. They're really, this is probably the dream board for a lot of people if you're looking for a white themed build, just because really when you put in memory here, especially if you pick white memory, this board is going to look very, very white, right? So it provides you very, very minimal elements in terms of any additional white. And actually, in my opinion, it actually will seem even more white than what we did with the Apex, even though the Apex has a white PCB. Um, here you go to five M.2 SSDs. So again, that's an upgrade, of course, with PCI Express Gen 5 support, right? Um, now, an upgrade compared, of course, to the Hero and to, the, of course, the Apex is this also does have the OLED Live Dash display. The formula is the only board outside of the Extreme that has this two inch OLED Live Dash display. So there you can have information like debug readout information, such as the debug LED. You can also have status on things like USB BIOS flashing, you can have animations, you can have temperature, you can have water flow information. There's a lot of stuff that you can put into the OLED Live Dash display. There's more high speed uh, rear USB 3.2 ports on this board. So we'll actually show the difference there. Um, it has the Dimflex technology that we talked about earlier. It has Wi-Fi 7 with Q antenna. The actual hybrid chill VRM heatsink block has been entirely redesigned. So it's actually an entirely new design. It's actually now uh, all copper. And then it has actually an enhanced electro plate, excuse me, electroplating process, which is even uh, to a higher degree than what it was in the prior generation. So this is entirely different than in the prior generation. Um, the ESS Sabre DAC and AMP has also been revised to a different version here with the 9218. Uh, we have a drop down in the SATA ports. Again, here there were six and here there's four, but of course you go up to the five M.2 SSDs, including the Gen 5 support. You have the AMP2 memory support, the QLED with the dim, de dim detect feature, the reinforced USB 3.2 header, and then you also have the Intel software suite. Now that's independent of the spec upgrade. Um, the spec upgrade, keep in mind, this is just what's new between this formula and this formula. This is not, that doesn't cover the spec upgrades comparing uh, let's say the hero to let's say the formula if you want to jump into the formula if you're comparing the dash a to the formula right like a whiteboard to a whiteboard because there's going to be other spec like take for instance like this board has five gigabit networking where all the other boards only have 2.5 gigabit networking so those are going to be other differences right so um let me go ahead and then uh, just get here to our secondary camera we'll go a little bit of a closer look at the board and i'll also go ahead and jump into your guys's questions here um, JJ, when are the boards going to be available for purchase on Amazon? Um, Amazon is always a little bit variable in terms of the logistics. I would probably expect within the next two weeks, it could be a little bit longer than that for Amazon. I would probably expect first initial channel availability will be on our ASUS store and then probably Newegg. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Um, let me just see. Why did the, uh, let me see right here. 
Yes, so Tracy is asking uh, the DRAM validation. Yes, so we have actually done uh, high speed validation on this, but as always, keep in mind that you're gonna have variability when it comes to the quality of the memory controller, defining what's the kind of the maximum speed for memory that you can get. So even though we can validate to a certain speed, it doesn't necessarily mean that your CPU's memory controller will be able to do that speed. Um, in terms of what we've done on the formula, the formula has been validated for 8,000 MT plus, but yes, the apex is even higher. So overall, you'll find that these Z790 refresh boards are validated to even a higher DDR5 memory spec than in our prior generation boards. And that's also just in general an upgrade from Z690 to Z790. Uh, the signal topology was improved from Z690 to Z790 as a whole. So you actually had generally gen on gen, even with the same CPU, a higher level of DRAM scaling, usually in the range of somewhere about like four to 600 plus MT. So if you might've seen like a limit before, like around 7,000, maybe the other boards would get you closer to about like 7,600. So nominally there was also improvements. Uh, but keep in mind, all the Maximus boards have higher grade PCBs, low loss PCBs, higher layer count than also what you would see like on Strix or on the uh, Tough Gaming series. But uh, let's go ahead and take a, a closer look here at the board. Okay. Oh, well, I'm going to have to bring down my exposure a little bit because the board's so bright. <laughs> All right, there you go. All right, so looks really nice. Of course, uh, you might get a little bit of shine just because uh, the the I, there's still so much uh, so many peels that are still essentially on here. But you can see that really nice, clean, integrated RGB lighting design. You can see the actual OLED light, OLED. OLED Live Dash display, that two inch OLED Live Dash display. You got the dual CPU power connectors that are gonna of course be on here. You can see just like the Hero, we have the grouped fan connectors. Uh, you can also have the, of course, the debug LED, but keep in mind the OLED Live Dash display can actually give you debug readout information. You've got the USB-C, which also supports the 60 watt charging. Um, then you of course have the corresponding PCI power connector for the 60 watt charging. You do have the ejection uh, mechanism there. So you have the actual PCIe uh, Q release design Design right there. You have the QLED with the uh, dim to tech technology that we talked about earlier. This is a massive just heatsink. This is a dual contact heatsink design as well. Just like the Hero and the Apex, this board also is going to have the dual PCI Express Gen 5 on this board. Um, and just like the Hero, this is just one large essentially M.2 heatsink and you're going to remove that and there are going to be multiple M.2 that are going to be dual contact, right? So that means, again, if you guys don't remember, we can show again, but the dual contact design essentially just means that the heatsink is on the, uh, is, is on both sides, on the top and on the bottom, right? So dual contact means right there, right? That we have, of course, the heatsink and there's the thermal pad and there's the heatsink and the thermal pad, right? So you guys can see that right there. Okay, um, as we move kind of all the way down right there, you'll see also you have the secondary front USB 3. So your USB 3, then you have a USB 3. So you got the two right there, the PCI alteration mode switch and the water cooling fan headers. Now for the VR, uh, for the VRM, right? This right here, the hybrid chill. Um, again, you do not have to use this uh, with water cooling, but of course those, that's where your course uh, you can go ahead and connect this to your loop if you wanted to connect this to your loop. But again, even if you're overclocked, right, you do not need uh, to actually use water cooling. So you can entirely actually be confident that the actual VRM assembly, as well as the actual um, integrated heatsink design is essentially going to be able to run with stability and reliability, even under overclock configuration. Okay. So for most users, like I said, they will probably end up buying the formula and not using this, but for some water cooling enthusiasts, they may want to integrate, uh, of course, their water cooling loop into the VRM block. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and see right here. Uh, quick questions that came up. Um, let me see. Um, so why does the C7 formula did not have EK branding? That's because this is actually our own in-house. Uh, there's, it's not a collaboration. We continue to be a great partner with EK. So EK will continue working with us to have like block support on different motherboards and graphics cards. But the reason why it's not EK is because it's actually a different design. So this is like, as I noted, an entirely new design that is specific to the Z790 formula. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and see right there. Uh, does a 60 watt charging, 
Does the 60 watt charging have anything to do with GP performance? No, it doesn't have anything to do with it. So that 60 watt charging right here for this USB-C port, if this power is connected, it's only for that 60 watt charging. There's nothing in relation to needing auxiliary power for this GPU or anything like that. So that's, you only need to connect that supplemental PCI, a PCI Express power connector if you want the 60 watt charging. If you don't connect it, um, I have to double check, but I believe the maximum wattage output, I think is, it's like 15 or 20 watts. It's, you still get higher than standard USB output, but you won't get the 60 watts. If you want 60 watts, you have to connect the uh, PCI Express auxiliary connector, okay? Um, will the PCB frame bend uh, without a contact frame? I mean, you have a lot of torsion uh, resistance on this board because this board is just like the uh, the Hero, right? Where you actually have um, a backplate on this board as well. So it's quite nice in terms of that. So you can see right here that you have a full backplate. Didn't screw that back down there. Um, so overall, I wouldn't worry. But also keep in mind, um, I'm not actually necessarily a big fan of contact frames. I know a lot of overclockers out there do like them, but I don't actually advocate for them because I find that I can get very good DRAM from overclocking and temperature results without it. Because I also I prioritize real world temperatures as opposed to synthetic temperatures, where like you know Prime 95 or OCCT or stuff like that, which is good for validating stability, but it's not going to be representative of what you do normally with a system. So Contact frames tend to really be most beneficial, I would say, for multi-threaded workloads. Um, and the reality is also if you incorrectly install a contact frame, because you can actually be affecting the actual um, contact force, right, that you have between the ILM and the heatsink and everything else, it can actually affect a memory channel initial initialization. So usually what I tell people is kind of like do your whole setup and only if you really feel that you're, you know, you really are concerned about temperatures or you find that you really want to improve them that much, would I consider doing some form of like a contact frame? Um, but that's your choice, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's PCDIY, so you can go and do with what you think kind of works best for your build, but it's not necessarily something that you have to be worried about, okay? Um, let me go ahead and go right here. Any other quick questions? Uh, JC's water break. Yeah, I think I'm going to take a little bit of water right here. Um, So probably not recommended, but are you able to use a PCI Gen 5 SSD with its own heatsink, or do you have to use the heatsink on the motherboard? So yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, I don't know if I have it over here. I had um, a T700, so. Um, yeah, but uh, the PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSDs, right? A lot of the higher performing ones will have their own heatsink. So generally most vendors, like crucial differences with the T700, they sell one without a heatsink and then they sell one with a heatsink. So we would always recommend that you would buy the one without the heatsink and then use our heatsink. Our heatsink is going to actually be much more dense than what would come from that manufacturer. So you would get better thermal performance. So my recommendation would be to always use our heatsink and to buy the M.2 SSD that does not come with a heatsink. For some reason, there's a drive and it only comes with the heatsink then uh, yes, you would actually have to remove the heatsink. The heatsink would actually have to be removed because there's no way to run both at the same time. Also, it would kind of break apart the kind of design motif, right? Because, um, you know, this whole OLED dive dash display wouldn't look, you wouldn't have that there, right? Because you would have to remove it and then you would be putting that, that just that M.2 SSD. So an example right here, if we did that, um, let me go back here. Um, so if uh, you can see right here, if we went back and let's say I took this off, just to put a drive that had its own heatsink. So this Patriot drive has its own heatsink. Now this is much smaller. This is only a ultra high speed gen four drive, right? But if I did put that in there, um, you would see one, you see a little bit of that. I mean, the thermal pad would be gray and everything, but you can kind of see it would break apart the, the kind of the look, right? So it really wouldn't, it wouldn't be that great, right? Where ideally here, you'd be much better off just taking off that heatsink and then putting this on there that way. So that's that's my recommendation is if, if, if that clarifies kind of what your question is right there. Um, the Hydro Kill design is cool. Yeah, I'll show you guys a little bit of a quick design going to that. Uh, contact frames are easy to install. Yes, they are not necessarily complicated to install. The main issue is actually the amount of torque, the force that you actually have to use to apply the contact frame. Sometimes actually users can actually have too much torque and that torque, like I said, can affect pin to pad, uh, pin to pad contact pressure. So between the CPU uh, and the pad, uh, and the pins in the socket, and that can actually cause memory channels to drop out. Um, you can actually have lower uh, DRAM scaling, so there can actually be issues. Um, 
Is the VRM water block? Yes, it's copper, and then it has an actually electroless plating on top of that, which I, it, which also passed an extensive salt spray test. Um, so for additional kind of performance, right? Um, it's really cool that we can put the same motherboard. Yes. So yes, you can, uh, if you have for some reason, maybe like a Z690 motherboard, a more basic motherboard, and you had a 12900K, which is still a great part, and maybe you just wanted to upgrade to one of these new boards. Yes, you can entirely run, uh, do that. Use a torque screwdriver for the torque. Yes, you're right. Not everybody has a torque screwdriver, and even a basic good quality torque screwdriver is probably 40 to 60 bucks, right? So again, you know, it's, it's kind of like, do you have those things, right? Um, and again, you know, you just have to account for that. There's also technically a spec that's defined by Intel. And if you actually breach the torque rating, you can actually still have these issues, even if you're in adherence. But overall, it's generally not an issue if you install it correctly. But as I noted, because you can already have very good overclocking, you can already have good temperatures. I don't see it as being something that we recommend, right? It just adds more complexity to a build. And it's really only something I recommend for users that are absolute kind of enthusiasts that are looking to squeak out every single temperature. Because again, the temperatures are really only of a benefit when you talk about, I think, measuring them under a synthetic workload. When we're talking about gaming, um, you know, you can run a 13900K with actually a tower heatsink with like a Noctua U12S or U14S, even overclocked, and it won't thermally throttle, right? Um, but if you want to run Prime 95 or Cinebench 23 or 24 and you run it, run it for an hour, which is never going to be indicative of a game, and you want to use that as your thermal benchmark, it's unrealistic, but feel free to use that. And, and in that scenario, you might notice that you might feel that you might get more of a benefit from a contact frame, but you aren't really getting a benefit under the gaming workload because the temperatures weren't very hot in the first place, right? That's where there's a fundamental difference between uh, just understanding how load affects your temperatures, right? And games and general desktop applications are quite a bit different than synthetics, right? The only time that some users should be more conscious of that is I think more professional users um, using applications where they're heavily utilizing multi-threaded workloads. So maybe somebody using like After Effects, um, maybe DaVinci Resolve, Premiere Pro, um, 3D Studio Max, maybe workloads where they're really doing a lot of sustained multi-threaded workload. And in that scenario, you know, temperatures will be more of a factor, right? Um, but let's lastly recap right here just on the redesign here for the actual uh, hybrid chill. So let me go ahead and just move over right here and we'll take a look. So in terms of the new design for some people are asking, this is actually the way that it looks, right? So you can see the full copper design, the wave fin, the electroless nickel plating design, right? Which also has to pass, pass our new assault free testing, which has even been uh, the application of actually the electroless uh, plating is actually even to a higher degree than we did on the prior version, along with the full copper design, the gasket, the threaded design, and then the metal cover. So that is pretty much covering the entirety of that design. And again, this can be run fully. It can be run fully with no, um, with no water cooling. So if you want to run this passive, you can entirely run this passive. So you're entirely fine. So overall, guys, uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring up that slide again to just recap there the design difference uh, between the formula, the older model and the newer model. And we can recap. So again, an aesthetic update, five M.2 SSDs, right, including PCI Express Gen 5, more rear high speed USB 3.2. Um, actually, I'll show the rear I.O. quickly. The dim flex technology that we talked about, right? Uh, which is a hardware-based design, the Wi-Fi 7 with the Q antenna, the new Hybrid Chill VRM uh, heatsink and block, the revision to the ESS Saber deck and amp, a reduction in the SATA ports, but you get more M.2, AMP2, the QLED with dim detect, and the reinforced USB 3.2, and the Intel software suite. Okay, so those are going to be all of our items right there. Let me quickly just show you the rear I.O., so uh, we can re wrap that up there. So give me one second. I go here to our images. And we'll go here to the formula. All right. So here you guys can see the board and we'll take a look there at the rear IO. So four USB, uh, that's going to be five gigabits. Then you've got 10 gigabits, 40 gigabits, 40 gigabits. So these are going to be your Thunderbolt ports, 10 gigabits, and then 10 gigabits uh, there for the USB. So three USB type C. So that's going to be four. That's going to be eight. That's going to be 10. That's going to be 12. So lots of USB five gigabit networking. So that's going to be twice as fast as what's on the uh, Apex or on the Hero, Wi-Fi 7, and then multi-channel line level audio out for the rear IO. All right. So overall, guys, uh, that pretty much, um, let me see, what differences does it have uh, to the Hero, right? So um, I think your most probably immediate things, of course, is going to be the full shroud, right? It's also going to be that it has 
uh, excuse me, five gigabit networking, the OLED Live Dash display, right? Um, but otherwise, for most of the other things, they're pretty much going to be the same, right? So I think it's just going to come down to whether you really want white, you want five gigabit networking, you want the OLED Live Dash display, right? Because they're both also going to support five uh, M.2 SSDs, and they're all the other Q, uh, Q technologies are going to be the same. So pretty consistent, okay? All right. So um, I think that's pretty much it. All right, guys. So that pretty much wraps up our stream, guys. Um, if you guys have any other questions or comments, feel free to go ahead and join us in our PCDIY group. We're going to have, like I said, more content coming out in terms of the boards. Join us for our upcoming performance live stream where we'll actually do demonstration of uh, FlexDim. We'll do a demonstration of AMP. We'll do a demonstration of AIOC. We'll talk about overclocking expectations for 14th gen. Um, and uh, we'll also have dedicated, smaller kind of focused little overviews for each one of the boards in the lineup coming in probably the next like week and a half to two weeks. So there'll be kind of a consolidated kind of overview board, which will also include some performance uh, testing there too. So if you kind of want to get a little bit of sense of what's going on there, that'll hopefully also give you some insight. But that wraps up our essentially our introduction to the latest generation ASUS Z790 series based motherboards, where we have updates for the Tough Gaming series, the RG Strict series, and the RG Maximus series. So hopefully that gives you guys enough information to go ahead and pick the right board for you when you go about either upgrading or building your system, uh, taking advantage of the latest generation Z790 chipset, as well as, of course, any one of Intel's Socket 1700 series processors, whether it's 12th gen, 13th gen, or now the latest 14th gen series processors. So ultimately, uh, hopefully you guys found this interesting and useful. Hit that like button. Go ahead and drop us some comments and join us in the PCDIY group. With that, take care, take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day.